Welcome to Flat Earth Debate Uncut and After Show. I'm your host Nathan Oakley and if you are new to this channel or you've not done so already then be sure to subscribe, hit the bell notification icon and join button if you'd like to become a Nathan Oakley 1980 channel member and keep up to date with the Flat Earth Debate. If you would like to support the channel there is a super chat that runs alongside each of these shows while they premiere and there's also a PayPal, Patreon and crypto link in the info box below the video. Also below this video you can get £50 for swapping your UK electricity supplier to Octopus Energy. Speaking of Patreons, I'm going to do a quick shout out to all of you who do support me on Patreon. So a massive shout out of thanks and appreciation to Austin Whitsitt, John Kays, DL Hill, Julian Jeremiah, Tommy Swagnets, Michael Kahn, Patrick Gunnels, Banter, Will Brax, Mel B. Styles, Troy Shuka, Bose Nail, Samson, Maris, Harry Blade, Mobile Mac 777, Neo The One, Lost Cat FE, Rob W, Open Minded, Reese Pound, Dal West Watson, Mike, Muted, Dick Earth Skeptic, Maria Neelands, Unbelievable Productions, Blue Ridge Ranger, Rob H, The Real Gabster, Windrider, Liam Nedrick Jr., Abraham Mohammed, Nyby, Adrian Quintana, Skeptic936, Life is Short, Fireball X, The Flat Earth Channel.com, Texas Mike, Edwin Johnson and David Wayne Foster. So another massive thank you to all of you for supporting me on Patreon. Now I'm going to hand over to whoever is in Google and Discord so you can enjoy their conversation while I set up for today's live show. No, I just want you to like hear me out and like look into this and then yeah just are you taking advantage this. of my sleepy nature right now righteous <laughs> <laughs> is uh, that what you're doing man is calm i'll take that as a bonus that's a well, sleeping i mean if anybody's man. calm it's a bonus so i mean come on let's face what's it, going right? on you just want to ask him something just ask him. yeah i want to i want to <laughs> talk about the the verse where the circle of the earth comes from right yeah in the scripture yeah and that original hebrew word is kug right We'll have to look at it, but I did. Ha I have looked at it before. It's not the word for ball that he uses in another passage, correct? Right. I'm not talking about the ball here. Obviously, I'm talking about. No, the... I'm just saying. I, I know what you're. I can't remember if the word was Krug. I have right. to look it up. But when I did, it's... it was a different word. Yes. Yeah, it's Krug, and it was only used like three times. Yeah, it was yeah, only used like three times. I, at least the reason according I... to one Go on. Yeah, but when I looked it up, there was another reference of kicking something down the hill, and that was the word ball. Or I uh, was talking about the enemy or something, just, you know. And uh, That might the, be a different word, because there was, like, a lot of words. No, it was. It was a different word. Yeah. That's my point. Yeah. Okay. So, yes, it no, does say circle. Well, it was translated to circle, compass, and circuit, I think, or something along those lines. Yeah, something to that and effect. King James, at least. Up. Yeah, I would go But that the far thing is, say... the context of like the context. I'm looking at the context, right? The context says he walks on the circle of the earth, right? And the inhabitants thereof are as grasshoppers, right? So from Correct. this coog he walks on, people look like grasshoppers from that viewpoint. So this coog is above the earth. Follow what I'm saying? Yeah, but it also says in other places that he, he drew a line upon it. Uh, a line is a straight line. Uh, so you got to put that into right. context of everything. Uh, and well, wait a second. His, hang on, hang on, hang on. Uh, because I look at the whole thing, not just that. And then uh, okay. the, his throne is on the north, the, uh, the uh, other most parts of the north. And so the north what is the north is it uh is it is it a uh do we have a circle plane and the north is directly above and from every portion like a circle of equal altitude that points to the center the north is that what it is i mean it could be well it's interesting you said pointed out that there's a verse like that because there was something else i was sitting on but that's a different topic though but it's interesting you pointed out that, that he sits, like, in the north. Well, in my mind, it, I mean, you know, because this goes to some verses in the Bible that uh, are there as hints, but 
uh, in my mind have a picture of it, which I could just say it's my belief at this point, is four corners of the earth are actual corners. There's a circle inlaid right. in it, and there's a foundation to the earth. And so all right. those verses could be put together. Uh, is it that? I don't know. You know, because I, it's, it could That's be. where I'm trying to jump in. Because you see, we're jumping at it like from like a model, preconceived model in our heads, like you said. You have a vision of it already, right? And I'm trying to like break down having a vision and starting from the ground up, like starting from God's word moving forward, right? Instead of having these preconceived ideas, because that's how people got in trouble with the heliocentric model. They had that idea in their heads. And when they read God's word, they just seen the heliocentric model somehow, right? No. That, and I no, think the same issue. Has, no. No, that happened. That, that, no, they had a flat plane uh, with uh, a firmament with everything in the firmament as their models, so to speak, the way you want to put it. And it wasn't until uh, the scientism got sold to the quote unquote church, in my opinion, that they started looking for scriptures they can uh, twist around. And so, oh, circle. Circle means a ball floating in space. No, that, that's a far cry from what the Bible teaches, because in Genesis it says he made the earth first, and then he put the heavens inside the earth contained by a firmament. So there goes your heliocentric Copernicus model right there. Okay. But let's hold on. Let's standpoint. Let me put, push. All I'm saying is that there's still heliocentric Christians out there that read God's word and they know God very well. And the well, only that's reason. A different, hang on, hang on. That's a different question. Those are non. How can I put it? Uh, those are parroted statements they tell you because they heard the pastor give a talk. They've never researched it. So they're parroting something. I, and the pastor I, got it from science. Hang on. The pastor got it from scientism that got snuck into the church uh, because he doesn't want to stand up and say NASA's. BS pictures. Doesn't want to do that because he's going to look funny if he does. They don't know what we know. If they knew what we know, uh, because I, I've got pastors on record saying NASA's lying and it's not what it is. And then you've got pastors pushing the heliocentric scientism that's snuck into the church version. So they're just unstudied parishioners, in my opinion. And I challenge well, them all the time. <laughs> that's who I talk to mostly. <laughs> they don't know what to say. Well, I don't want to say that. Uh, all I'm trying to say is that they have this idea, and until the Lord reveals it to them through his word, then they're kind of stuck with that idea until it gets revealed to them. And I'm saying the same thing that a work, like how it applied to the heliocentric model, the same thing applies to like this iffy model people have in their heads is what I'm trying to say. Okay. No, I, I know what you're doing, but I, I'm going to take you down a different road. You've got uh, Wait a second. What about say, my road? <laughs> We're not going to red airing onto your well, road, because, are we? Because, no, it's not, it's not. I'm going to take you down a different road. I didn't say it was my road. I don't have roads. In Didn't fact, hear Marty, him. where we're going, said, we don't need roads. He said, <laughs> <laughs> we're basically, I like that. So the objection is, I, I, I've got no horse in this race, by the way. I just want to point out the objection that was raised. The objection is, hold on, you want to segue onto a different road. Can't we stay on my road? And you said, no, no, no. I want to go on to a different road. It's like the exact same thing. You just reiterated <laughs> it in a slightly different tone and timbre. Yeah, I know, that was good. Because he he's, I see where he's going, and, and I want to bring in something else as a contrast, as a road. That's all. So, because he's, he's saying, how come some Christian teachers and Christian parishioners still think it's heliocentric? So I want to tie something to that. Okay, there's plenty of scriptures in the Bible that say the love of money is the Wait, bad, I don't want to go there. I do. I don't want to go there because I don't want to judge these get, other get, Christians. Get on that Wait road. Get on that road. Get on that no, road. we're not getting on that road. I don't want to talk about other... <laughs> Christians and no, no, what they're not, I'm not talking they are. About Christians. I'm talking I want to avoid that altogether. That. Well, then don't talk about what you said because you brought Christians who yeah. are heliocentric. Uh, uh, okay, right, stop, just stop. Now I'm intrigued, mainly because you said you don't want to hear it. <laughs> I've got to be honest. I don't want to hear it because I don't want to. I don't want to judge other Christians, right? 
We're supposed to judge. It, it says in the Bible to judge wisely. You're, you're mis that, that's another one. It, the, the misrepresentation of judging wisely versus don't judge prematurely cannot be mixed together. Uh, the listen, premature, I was just going to add something the there because you, you, oh, you tried ahead. to segue on to the love of money is the root of all evil. And yeah, that, particular, that particular passage was given to me as a child by my mother and given me incorrectly. Money is the root of all evil, right? Well, right. because of that particular thing told to me at a very early age, I had a kind of, uh, I don't know what the word, I didn't hate money, but by the same token, I wasn't exactly that fond of it either. You know, I tried to not steer my life in that direction because I thought it was bad. And then when I was a fully grown adult, I think I was married, <laughs> and just before my grandma, who was very, very elderly, like well over 100 at the time, um pointed out to me that it was wrong she's like it's not the love of, it's not money is the root of all evil it's the love of money obviously yeah. you need money you can't despise money but loving money and therefore you know doing other things that might be bad as a result of your love of the money is the root yeah. of all evil as she explained it to me well, so see, now, Nathan, you have the true biblical interpretation of that scripture because uh, the Lord uh, blessed so many of his uh, saints or followers uh, in, in the Old Testament as well uh, with money and riches if they obeyed. So it's not the riches, it's the love of the riches. Same thing goes with alcohol. It's the getting drunk that's wrong. It's not drinking alcohol that's wrong. Same thing for that. So I just go, I, I could go down the list of these things that I've had to debate Christians with. I say, okay, that's nice. Uh, what's your past? Oh, you were a Baptist. Okay, well, what, what does the Bible say? The Bible doesn't say, don't drink. It doesn't even say, don't be merry. It says, don't get drunk with it. Same thing with the money thing. So when the righteous brings in heliocentrism, snuck into the church, and why do some Christians and pastors teach the heliocentric model? It's the same thing. They're making the same mistake. They're now going to the scripture, reading Genesis, uh, contrasting that with other verses in the Bible that lend more credit, uh, not credibility, but more uh, scriptures towards that Genesis view of creation. God made the earth first. God made the firmament second. God put the universe inside the firmament on day four. Where is that in the heliocentric model? I just, it's, it's just like uh, the Sexton argument. Once I found out that it was designed to achieve an angle, I didn't care about LHA, SHA, GHA. I don't care about those things, about how it works in the minutia of getting the right time and blah, blah, blah. What's the, what's the tool for? Getting an angle? How do you achieve an angle? Boom. Knock it out of the park right, right. there. All right. Just to bring it back on point again, that's right. Looking at God's words, seeing what God actually says about it. Okay. Now let's get back on Correct. that. Right. Okay. So now, so now you got to do proper hermeneutics and you got to exegete the passage instead of put your opinion in and uh, do exegesis. Uh, because now you're reading what you want into it, which is, and this is where Paul is great at it, because she just breaks these things down wonderfully. All right, now let's let's get back to that. He walks or sits upon the cougar of the earth. Let's get back to that. Circle okay. of the earth. Translated to circle of the earth in King James. But let's, I'm just going to call it cougar for now, okay? What does so? Hold on. Well, now, hold on, hold on. If you're going to call it that, but disagree with it being circle of the earth by translation from Hebrew to English, what's what do you say the word means? Is it kuch? How do you say it? Well, one of the one of the uh, definitions for it is horizon or vault of heaven. He sits on but the I'm horizon just going to call it kuch because I, I want the reason the reason I'm calling a kuch is because I want the surrounding context. I want us to look at the surrounding context to see what the Coog is. That's the reason why I'm calling it Coog. Follow me? You're kind of leaving yeah, it open. We're going to we're gonna have to do, we're gonna well, have to do um, more of a... I, so, hold, hold on, on a second. Ten, you guys haven't even... I don't see the issue. Let me explain my position again. Okay, go on. Or, well, Nathan, what did you want to say quick? Well, I wanted to ask, what's the problem with the Hebrew to English translation? What's wrong with circle? I don't get it. Well... Okay, I'm going to go through it. All right. You see, let's just, let, me, let me go through it again. Okay, he walks upon the kug of the earth. The inhabitants thereof are as grasshoppers, right? So from this place he walks on, the inhabitants of earth look like grasshoppers. So this kug 
is he's not walking on the earth. He's walking on the Kug that's above the earth, right? So this Kug is above us, right? That's, that's what I'm trying to say. And it's something he walks it's the on. the only way you would have a horizon while looking at the grasshoppers below. In my estimation, Wait a second. No, no, more, no I'm talking to Tanti. Hold on, Eli. There's too many Look, people. You, you, you've come late. It's, you're getting too involved. Too it's not about the grasshoppers. There. <laughs> right. So no, but he said horizon. That's so, the trans all right. Forget it. Never mind. My bad. Uh, let me just focus. So basically, what I'm saying is like the surrounding context is that this kook is above us, because from this kook above us that God walks on, we look like grasshoppers to him. So it's he's not talking about walking on the earth. He's talking about walking on this kook that is above the earth, because the context is. We look like grasshoppers from this coup that he walks upon. So you follow what I'm saying, Tenth Man? Of the Can context for this coup? Let me just read the verse before and the actual verse, okay? Have you not known? Have you not heard? Hath it not been told you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? It is he that sitteth upon the circle of the earth and the inhabitants thereof are as grasshoppers that stretcheth out the heavens as a curtain and spreadeth them out as a tent to dwell in. There's your container. All right, but what's the saying about the coup? What's that context saying about the coup to you? Well, I have to look up that word Because we're looking at the word coup. Yeah, the first 22, let me go to, but I'm just going to look it up in the interlinear and concordance. I'm not, I need to go to the other um, uh, resource for Hebrew to get a more definitive. But here it would say, <laughs> upon the circle. Okay. H O O G, Chug. I think the translation is Chug or Chug, pronounced perhaps. Ooh. Circle. It means circle, circuit, compass. And number two is uh, B D B. I don't know what that means. Uh, vault of heavens. Uh, once as a circle, once as a circuit, and once as a compass, uh, uh, according to Strong's. That word let's, is being used. Let's not look at the definitions. Sir, let's look at the context of the surrounding words where it was okay, used. But it's just, we just read the scripture. <laughs> well, it sounds, there's, hold on, there's uh, just as an impartial on listener, it sounds like he's, it, it's being told to someone to contextualize omnipresence. That's how it sounded to me. Gotta read, I've got to read the, the verses well in advance of that. Uh, let's see. Uh, to if, you say, if you say someone sits on a circuit, it's like, well, wouldn't you normally travel around a circuit? If you're sitting on a circle, it's like, well... Are you, that doesn't make sense, exactly. Exactly, it doesn't make sense. So to me, it sounds like a, a way of describing something to somebody that makes them realize omnipresence. But I've said that twice, so nobody acknowledged it. Maybe here, I'm just here, wrong. Here, Nathan, here, Nathan, verse 12, for example. Okay, the, the verse with circles, 22, but verse 12 says, Isaiah 40, Who hath measured the waters in the hollow in his hand, meted out the heaven with the span, and comprehended the dust of the earth in a measure, and weighed the mountains and scales and the hills in the balance. Who hath directed the spirit of the Lord, or being his counselor has taught him? With whom took he counsel, and who instructed him, and taught him in the path of judgment, and taught him knowledge, and showed him the way of understanding? Behold, the nations are as a drop of a bucket, and are counted as small dust of balance. Behold, he taketh up the isles as very little thing. And Lebanon is not sufficient to burn, nor the beast thereof sufficient for a burnt offering. That's the uh, cedars of Lebanon, the big trees. All nations before him are as nothing, and they are counted to him less than nothing in vanity. Verse 18, to whom then will you liken God? Or what likeness will you compare him 
uh, unto him. The workman melts a graven image, and the goldsmith spreads it over with gold and casts silver chains. Verse 20, he that is so impoverished that he hath no obligation, no oblation, chooseth a tree that will not rot. He seeketh unto him a cunning workman to prepare a graven image that shall not be moved. Have ye not known, have ye not heard, have it not been told you from the beginning, have ye not understood from the foundations of the earth? It is he that sits upon the circle of the earth, and the inhabitants thereof are grasshoppers, that stretcheth out the heavens as a curtain, and spreads them out as a tent to dwell in. Yes. That bringeth the princes to nothing, he maketh the judges of the earth as vanity. So there's your context. Yeah, it, so I was right then. He's describing omnipotence and omnipresence. Yeah. Well, this Kug, we're also told in another place, he places on the face of the deep. And remember, like, the deep is like like the waters that are separated. Just but anyways, that... Nathan, Nathan got what I said, and I'm actually glad he, he got that. He's seen that it, like, it doesn't make sense to say you're sitting on a circle, right? And I'm glad he, he caught that. That's, that's all I wanted no, no, to no. point out. That, that, I think that's lost it. in translation, though, right? Just because it's clear that that's not the word that's being used and when translated into circuit compass or circle it doesn't make particularly great sense but if that word is to, is designed to give you an idea of an all-encompassing expanse so when you say compass you could envisage that meaning all of the different directions that a compass would give you in other words everywhere right or a circuit well a circuit goes round and round and round and you're is, is in, encompassing all of it or a circle is, is it, it all points towards the same thing i just think the hebrew has got a better word than the english that's all this is yeah i agree and it's talking well, about in context that he's uh, he's he's built the earth and everything that is for the earth and here you guys go to a guy who chops down a tree and makes an, some kind of oh, image hold on. oh done i just think i've tweaked why righteous has brought this up Suddenly, it's all has the penny dropped for Nathan. We'll find out in a moment from Righteous. So, when this is contextualized as a heliocentric translation into globe or flat earth use of a two dimensional circle, in actual context, neither are really relevant to the context of this text, are they? Yes. So, other than to describe uh, omnipotence, am I saying that correctly? Omnipotence. Well, I'm not sure omnipotence, it that's the one. I knew I was fishing for it. If you're going to try and describe omnipotence, then it's a pretty good passage. If you're going to try and nat describe the nature of something that's being attempted to be verbalized as insignificant to somebody omnip omniscient, is that the right word? Om om omnipotence, all powerful, omniscient, all knowing, omnipresent. omniscient. Yeah, yeah, omnipresent is all, all, everywhere at once. It, it gave me the impression of, well, all of the Earth is just like it's like nothing to him. It's just like almost inconsequential. And you're just like, I don't know, a grasshopper sitting under a little tent to him. Right. That's how it sounds to right. me. No, well, no, that's, uh, can I be a part of the convo or not? Well, let me can. round it off here. Yeah, let me round it off here. Uh, yeah, all that is true too. But at the same time, many passages in the Bible, God does use the actual uh, physical things in, in the description of something in context with it. So, I mean, when we read this, it's talking about his his creation from the foundation. Hey, don't you know from the foundations that this is the way? So yeah, it's still talking about what he did, but the context of the scripture is what you caught there. But go on, Eli. If there's a circle on the top and there's a circle on the bottom and this must be contained, it sounds like a cylinder to me. <coughs> and he sits on the north, it says in the scriptures, all in heaven, uh -huh. his throne above the firmament is always above the north. So it, it, when you start looking at it, uh, it does start making sense. Now, but again, what Nathan is saying is if you're going to, and I would agree that if you're going to use the scripture in context, it's talking about uh, how God is greater than everyone else. And, you know, he's got omnipotence, omniscience, everything. But at the same time, he's using part of his creation to describe his omniscience. You say, OK, well, that's a clue. What's what's Genesis say? And what does uh, Ezekiel say? Because Ezekiel lends a lot to this. Right. And, but, uh, but by the same token, it's like if somebody's... Uh detailing a, a an accident that they've witnessed yeah and 
part of the detail is the weather, right? And they just say the weather was clear on that day. In other words, it wasn't pouring with rain to, to, to describe a, a mitigating circumstance to whoever they're describing it to, right? But then that person that they're describing it to starts really grilling them on the weather conditions. Well, what was the temperature? What was the air pressure? What was the humidity level? How low was the cloud cover? It's like, hold on, you're fishing for context in a passage that isn't contextually about this subject, right? So I get it. I think that's why Righteous has brought this up. Yeah, but he loses it in the verse itself because if you take the context, which we all get, God's omniscience, it says in verse 22, and he's not going to lie about it, it is he that sitteth upon the circle of the earth, and the inhabitants thereof are grasshoppers, meaning you're nothing to me. I mean, I made you. You're, uh, from my viewpoint, you're like a grasshopper. So context is still there, but it could still be using the actual uh, creation to describe his omniscience. Then well, he, he is. says that's... Yeah, I'm not saying course. he's going to... He, said... he is. I'm not saying he isn't. I'm just saying that contextually, that isn't the weight of importance being given to this passage. And the weight of importance that's been extracted from the passage is about the circle bit and about whether or not that can translate into a sphere or whether or not it gives you a flat plane. It's like, no, that's not the important weight that's being given to the text. And I'm sure it is accurate. I'm sure he wouldn't just throw it in there incorrectly because, well, contextually, I wasn't talking about that. I'm sure it's far more, there's far more importance that you could take from it. But given the overall gravitas of the text, it's not weighted towards that circle bit. And that is Correct. also lost in translation. Correct. Well, but well, hang on, hang well, on, hang well, on. Hang, well, hang, well, hang well, on, the well, second well, part. Well, second. Well, Eli, well, the second part, well, please. Well, please. Well, please. Well, Just well, let Eli get a word in, I don't want to be a part of Yeah, you're not. Like, relax. I thought he was addressing me. Go on. Go on. In context... He's not talking about the part that we dwell atop anyway. I think that that's really the point. Like the, the earth that we're standing on is entirely because people say, well, um, the earth itself is a circle, not a sphere. Nothing in the text speaks about what the surface of the earth is. It's talking about what he's standing on up there and how it mirrors what's underneath where we also can't go. I don't know if I got that from that context, Chile, but if you got that from it, fair enough. All right, the second part, if I may, that stretcheth out the heavens as a curtain and spreadeth them out as a tent to dwell in. Now, he, that's one of our housekeeping questions in context right there. Yeah, tent, curtain, neither of which are horizontal a planes. A, a, tent, a tent is a container. It might be, but it's not a horizontal plane, is it? However, we could be looking for context in this text that isn't really there, isn't is it? <laughs> you know what I mean? If, if the if the circle of equal altitude and the zenith position of each star is parallel on a plane, guess what you got to have? Wow, I can't believe within a few seconds you managed to directly translate the plumb lines you'd have to give you ninety degrees to a flat plane that you're measuring for triangulation to curtain i mean that's pretty impressive i mean i was going to accuse you of seeking out confirmation bias but i'm not going to now kudos it's a parallel it's got to be parallel because it's it's got a zenith position hey look just because i'm all agreeing with you don't mean that this is in any way i mean this is so <laughs> contextually far away from this it's untrue you know what? I'll ask Paula. I'll ask Paula to do a deep dive into this because there's other resources. Other than, Strong's is not the best one to go get. I can't remember what the one she uses, Look, but they are it, much I, better. I want, this is a brilliant, a brilliant point to bring up, right? And it, what didn't go the way I thought it was going to go when Wright just first started talking about it. So I want him to round out his point, if that's okay. Sure. If, if he has got something well. to round out with, that is, go ahead, Wright just. No, you kind of, you already picked up on it. And as long as somebody picked up on it, I'm good to go. I'm out of here. I can leave on a high note, I guess. <laughs> Just summarize it then. Basically, I was looking at it like this, right? I called it the Kug, because God sits on the Kug of the earth. There's another verse that says he walks on the Kug of the earth, or the Kug of heaven, right? And basically, in this context, I was using it as he sits on the Kug of earth. And from this Kug that he sits on, the inhabitants look like grasshoppers. So this 
a lot of people like to use this word as cougars the earth to say, look, it's the earth is a circle. It's the circle of the earth because it was translated the circle of the earth. But you can't sit on a circle, right? And it's not of the earth. It's something above the earth because the inhabitants look like grasshoppers from sitting on this coog, which is above the earth. How so you, you can't you sit, can't on, sit a on a circle. And they can, hold on hold a second. On. I haven't finished. Hold on. I'm hold on. Everyone knows and you Nathan, sit on footstools anyway. And Nathan picked up on this. Nathan picked up on this. He's like, that's right. You can't sit on a circle. That doesn't make any sense. And that's all I wanted to I hear. I want you to point out to you guys. It doesn't make sense to sit on a circle. That's it. And you got it, Nathan. Hear, I, on, I, I, I didn't hear Nathan. Number one, I didn't hear Nathan say that. Number two, what makes you think you can't sit on a circle? You'd be sat on a footstool or something, wouldn't you? You could sit Indian style on a circle. Why would you even say such a thing? Look, you don't sense. say you sit on a circle. You say you say it like this. If you let's say like there's a circle of a cement, right? You would say you were sitting on a cement shaped like a circle or cement circle cement, right? But you don't just say circle without the context of cement. You follow me? In the playground, and I'm telling kids what to do. I'll say, go and sit in that circle over there. In that circle. Or on that circle. It's the same. The, the same thing. You're right, you, Adam. All right, hold think, on a I sec. Can I talk to Nathan? Take, <laughs> Look, take he said that I'm agreeing with him and doesn't like Adam's comment. <laughs> Sorry, go ahead, Righteous. <laughs> well, I just, well, look, if we're saying we're sitting... Uh, how do I put it? it? It wouldn't make sense. It's like incomplete. You're, if you're saying go sit on a circle, that's incomplete, right? Go sit inside the circle of that park or whatever or that playground or that Ferris wheel, right? That's more complete. That's, if you just say I, circle, I, I, you, it's incomplete. I, what about everything I, that Ted read about just, not understanding and his understanding? I was just Neil. I was Neil. Stick, stick to the address. That, right? At the point. The I point was says, talking to my sister at that point. Oh, I don't righteous. Go ahead, Adam. The, the, the statement says on a circle already. Now, if you think about start, step out of the Bible, and I'll go back to the to the playground. If I've drawn a circle just a circumference i'd say sit in that circle if it was a whole marked out dot go and sit on that circle i don't exactly i don't, I don't see an issue with the language right. meaning uh definitively it can't um i would use both colloquially and understand it perfectly well i don't see a contradiction or a, adam it can't mean. i'm gonna go sit on the yeah. circle do you even know what i'm talking about if but I say I that, which circle yeah, you're talking yeah, about. yeah, yeah, but go and it's sit on just the red a, circle. Go it, and sit on the blue circle. It's been translated. See, it's never going to be perfect, exactly. right? Exactly. It's not Hebrew, so no, it's going to be slightly off because it isn't the same word. It hasn't got the same yes. origins. Hasn't got the same etymology. Hasn't got the same definition. Yes. It's been translated. So when people take right. the translation and then further interpret it into a spherical surface, for example, that's like so far removed from not only the context, not only the translation, but the translation of the translation makes no sense. So, yeah, I get your point. Yes. Yes, that's exactly it. Okay, Nathan got it. So, like, if you he really runs out, he run you well, you run Hold that on. really good. I, I just said, that, so just because I can summarise your point doesn't mean I necessarily agree with you, right? Just, just, just right. don't take things to mean what they don't. I'm summarising well, your you, point. <laughs> I love it. Well, that you means he is, agrees. I don't necessarily all right, agree. All right, all right, all right, all right, all right. I'll, I'll say Nathan doesn't agree, but at least Nathan sees what I was saying. So yeah, I get your point. I get your that. point. As an impartial gotcha. person with no horse in the race, I can understand and interpret what you're saying and reiterate it. Right. No problem. Can right. I ask one? Stop appealing to Nathan. Oh, three people at once. Adam, I think I can hear. Can, can, what's the original word? Because obviously the original word in Greek would be the one to work with. Who? What, what's that and it's, what's its definition? It's it's Hebrew and it's kug. And it was translated into like circle, circuit, compass, and stuff like that. But it was also translated into vault and horizon, and those aren't circles. So we need to look at the context to see what's really true. going on. With this. Ah, ah, the hold on. That's something I can disagree with. Not true. <laughs> yes. Circle, horizon. Yes, it is. Petri dish, cylinder. Anyway, you know. <laughs> hold on. Nobody picked up on what I just said. It's just been completely ignored. He said, a horizon's not a I circle. Said what I said, but... 
You're right. It is a circle because I mean, it, it's, it's well, I mean, in the context of how we see anyway, Nathan. Just what, one other question. Who's doing this sitting on this circle? God. So why are you restraining him by the rules of math? It's he doesn't sit on a circle. He sits on the coog. As to what this coog means, we're looking at the context to see what this coog means. And I'm by looking at the context, it can't mean circle. Is what I'm saying. It's God, isn't it? So it's a description it can... of God. It's not about a weird, a weirdy, weirdy bloke in the sky sat on a circle. It's a, it's a Hebrew description of how they're envisaging God in the heavens, isn't it? So that's kind of you've got to be probably this, more metaphysical this, than. No, this is God's Why word, not how people envision I'll God's word. No, 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 it is. It is righteous. He's he's right. So when he says envisage or envisage, how do you say that word? Envision. <laughs> How'd you say it, Adam? Envision? Adam just used the perfect word. Envisage. Oh. Envisage. This is God. Dis oh, who is actually saying it? God's word. But to give somebody without uh, omnipotence and all the rest of that list a way of interpreting interpreting something that is beyond their interpretation. So you've got to put it into some sort of physical terminology that makes it seem right. all encompassing. But that he translation is being given to a person for their interpretation so that they can understand it by God. Right. He uses he uses this, uh, this language you, right, and this just... language obviously more limited than God's language, right? But what's yeah. more important so he has is to that use you're the saying... best words to describe the which, best heavenly he has to use like earthly words to describe heavenly oh things my. which are above okay. like earthly things right here, here's my problem with what you're saying though this is what you're saying you can't sit on a circle my question to you is why couldn't theoretically if god had legs why couldn't he sit indian style on the floor on the circle why not because then we wouldn't look like grasshoppers why aren't you keeping up with god we wouldn't. Why not? You guys missed everything I said. The reason we look like grasshoppers is because he's seeing it from on high, the circle of the earth from on high. And the earth is also referenced as a circle. It, that, we just covered this. I okay. mean, it's, it's amazing how... No, right, I don't know. I don't it's know. amazing how... It's we're amazing grasshoppers. How he, the curtain's like a plumb line. Let's move on. Yeah, he said we were nothing uh, because his viewpoint, God's viewpoint is without him, nothing would exist. So he's, his magnificence is being drawn from these scriptures as well. And if you, again, go back to the context, he's talking about making Can I everything. But the word, the word appears in other places, and I just hit it a few times here. Uh, so uh, hath drawn as a circle a bound of the horizon line that's compare proverbs 8 27 job 26 10 uh prime root to draw around make a circle inscribe a circle yeah it's the same word coo okay. chug okay chug just want to so, give out just want to give out the definition yeah, of the yeah, Hello, can you hear me? We can. Yeah, but get, before you, please let me, Nathan, can I go to after you, please? You go ahead. Yeah, can go, I, can Eli, I say go. something real quick? You can, but just after Eli. Go ahead, Eli. I, I just want to mention that every time I come here with a burning desire, burning desire to talk about the moon, this is, it, we're to, this is what happens. Because last time I came in trying to talk about, you know, how the, the orientation or the light, or whatever it doesn't make sense. I I had to wait for it. Like it's righteous was in here. I think it was the same day we were talking about the water in the ocean seeming separated from some other. And it's like now we only have seven minutes left. Like I, I want to talk about what I want to talk about before the show starts. What's this got to do with grass? So you want to talk about you? <laughs> what? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, did, did I say I wanted to talk about me? Yes, did I say yeah. that I wanted to talk about what I want to talk about? Uh, your topic about is it. what you we want to talk about. Go on. I'm talking about right how you want to talk right about it. Uh, hello, five people. Hello. He's just tried to clear the airwaves. That's his version of, please, can you clear the airwaves so I can talk about what I was hoping to talk about? Go ahead, Eli. Hmm. 
But then again, there is a dude that was waiting to address that before we tail it out with whatever yeah, you like want to start with, Eli. So I'm going to go to that guy first. Something, what's your name again? Something old? Something old, new. I just want to ask, like, why do y'all give so much revere to this published printed book when the creator gave us senses and common sense to see what, what is what? It's like you follow for another paradigm or something. Then why do we? What do you mean by that? Well, that's a very, 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 very open-ended question, yeah. isn't it? That's <laughs> a whole new topic. Like, the, cre- the creator gave you everything you need to see what is what. Ain't no need for you to get a book that these people will very, basically give you for free for you to have. Like it seems like like it's another trick that you're falling for. Okay. So if the creator, well, so if maybe the creator, we allow Eli no, no. his question before the show starts. No, no. So if the creator, no, no, no. stop, stop, stop. Before he's just he's opened the floodgates to keep this continually going, and clearly, clearly, somebody else yes. wants to bring a different subject up. I appreciate your sentiment, but it, you, 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 your point might be valid. It's just so open ended. Well, I'll comment, please. Uh, if the creator wanted to communicate with his creation. Wouldn't he choose prophets and tell us, and those would be the scriptures, and that would be the book? Is that out of reach for you? Or could, just, could the creator I, just, if it wanted to reach us in that manner, could it just put all that stuff right in our mind? I mean, Why can't um, we could probably similar to you in, in understanding? I'm oh, sorry, no. Just, just, just to address that point, I'm probably similar to whoever's just made that point in understanding, but I think you also have to be respectful that there are people here, and lots of people that hold that book as it's delivered written word from God. I don't hold that opinion, but I can respect that and therefore understand why it's such an important book to them and why it's not just a book to them. Right, and why would you think that God doesn't put it in your mind. Maybe it needs to be in a book in order for you to I mean, recognize that it was put into your mind. That. How I about that? that? The Creator does put it in my mind. That's why I innately have my, you know, my conscience. I feel guilty about certain things that I do. But all the stories and stuff like that, like that people hold so dearly as if they, they know it's absolute fact. They speak of it with such conviction, like they know it's absolute fact. When there is nothing to show that these things even occurred at all but people actually, find actually you're very to wrong dwell on in their lives whether it's you're the actually, bible or other well, things it's called you're faith actually, it's called no, faith you're actually very, oh my gosh you're actually very wrong about that last statement of yours uh, the g- geography of the bible is solid so so hang on you're saying the book was put together in a way that how can you prove it well you got prophecy you got geography you got language you got people you've got all kinds of things that they've checked in the past okay, that that's true having... that's cool now i'm about okay. i'm about to shake up some people right now but who, who here has walked on water who here has walked on water come on guys friend. for real Come on. Excuse me. The person who walked on water came from above and was God in human form. So, yeah, God can walk on water. That's called violation of natural law that only God could do. Yes. Go on. What else do you want? Or something else. <laughs> that, 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 that was, that was so, such a convenient answer. Now, I love you guys. I'm shaking you up right now, but I'm being real, though. That's some real stuff. Nobody can walk on the wall. I'm not, I'm not shaking at all. If, if we want to turn this into a debate, do it during the show, please, because I want to present an idea so that I know whether or not I want to fucking bring it up in the next five minutes. <laughs> okay, God, the many arms of Ganesh. Oh, can you all calm on? down? Who is this blasphemer? All switch his head! Love the energy. It's not blasting. Yeah, I'm not. Uh, uh, go on, Eli. I th- Adam, but, pushing it, Adam. Oh, he's not like, I not like he's, he holds he holds a valid opinion. I just think he's a little disrespectful. Uh, be your cognizant own. that there's two minutes, and your brother did ask for it. Go, Eli. Go on, Eli. Going just anyway. Go on. You do it during the show. What the no, heck? because I don't. I want it. I want an opinion first. So, um, okay. You see the pictures that I got? I posted in Master B. God. No, I can't. Two minutes before the show, I've got other things to press. I'm afraid I can do it in the live Anyone show. Anyone else? Yes, I'm going to. Yeah, I'm looking at him. Red Moon. Okay. Red Moon. You see the orientation? Not really. 
What do you mean, not really? I Which see, portion of it is not? Thank you. Look, look, look. Uh, 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 hold on, hold on, hold on. In the name of Allah, hello. You all need to calm down and be a bit more respectful to each other, right? He's trying to present. He's trying to tell you stuff. Just give him short answers. I got it, Eli. I see it. Thank the top you. of it is cut off on the first one, and the second one, it's rotated, and the cutoff part is now on the side. Obviously. Thank you. But this is the point that I'm I, I'm, I'm going to ask you guys. Maybe I'm missing something in the heliocentric model. Is it the one I, on I, screen, Eli? Sorry. Uh... Okay, one minute left. Okay, one. Well, yes, 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 yes. Yeah. Okay, now, now that's eighty-eight degrees east, right? Okay, so now imagine that you're spinning towards that. We're not, we're not on the flat Earth. We're on the, the, we're on the ball, spinning towards that. At what point are you going to see that at the orientation that it is this morning that I took the picture? Which is the blue, which, you know, the blue sky, the, the moon, that picture. Is that possible in their story? How did they explain that? Welcome to Flat Earth Debate Live. I'm your host Nathan Oakley and if you are new to this channel or you've not done so already then be sure to subscribe, hit the bell notification icon and join button if you'd like to become a Nathan Oakley 1980 channel member and keep up to date with the Flat Earth Debate. If you would like to support the channel there is a super chat that runs alongside each of these shows while they are live and there's also a PayPal, Patreon and crypto link in the info box below the video. Also below this video, you can get £50 for swapping your UK electricity supplier to Octopus Energy. Most importantly, if you'd like to join the discussion, simply mute the page you are currently watching, then click the link in the info box below this video to join the panel and express your views on the nature of Earth. If you do join, please don't swear. If you do, you'll be ejected. And if you are, please don't try to rejoin the stream using sock accounts. You'll be warmly welcome back on the next stream. Please also share the show on social media. Sharing the show obviously increases the live audience, but this in turn increases the chances of a more diverse panel, so please share the show. Now we are joined by Neil, Eli, Adam Meakin, who else we got? Arwin, uh, Tenth Man, and a whole bunch of people in Discord, so welcome one and all. Greetings, everyone. Hey, hey, Nathan. Good afternoon. Hey, good morning, guys. Hey, good afternoon. Wow, very, in, very, very enthusiastic. Good to hear. Let's rattle our way through housekeeping. Any evidence of a physical geometric sphere horizon, formerly known as Earth Curve? Nah, negative. Uh, no, no, Oklahoma. it's an apparent position. Not yeah. from the circle of the Earth. Apparent position, yeah. All horizons are apparent, and the horizon in the physical geometric sphere edge horizon world of earth curve calculations is exactly that physical and geometric and beyond the limitations of an earth sphere radius 3959 as shown in the black swan if that wasn't clear for anybody who doesn't understand the implications we only have one horizon and the horizon in the globe model is physical and geometric it's claimed to physically obscure things in the distance and the geometry is how you calculate those drop values those hidden values utilize a tangent to a physical horizon known as earth curve that's been debunked by the black swan hope that's clear any evidence of axial rotation of the earth-based variety no 15 degree drift nathan 
and you need R for that. You need R for that. You do need R for that. Radians is the value that they give you the spin. Well, you're going to need an R for that. Any evidence of the R value? Earth radius. El Baruni disproved it. Al Baruni. Only in the math. I some say Al Baruni. Oh, that's, that's a great example, Arwen, isn't it, of the ball claim that the horizon is once again a physical geometric leading edge that is obstructing things physically. That's the premise for Al Baruni's calculation to up a mountain, see as far as he can to see the furthest bit of edge so he could make his calculations accurate, but all with the premise that that horizon is a physical leading edge. X1. Well, he, That's right, and it didn't work out. That. He was only several degrees off, you know? Because uh, he minimized the effects of uh, refraction, right? By going on top of the mountain. Did you want to add something? Uh, that 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 was to have the deep angle. Hold on, you George. needed a deep angle. Just, just one sec, George. Aaron Nu Neville. Aaron Aaron Neville. Tax as well. The the claim that he went up the mountain to minimize the effects of refraction is interesting because obviously when you go up higher Hello down to the life? alleged leading edge, that would take you through multiple layers of of different uh, layers of atmosphere plane, wouldn't it? You would have that graduated atmosphere, which would increase refractive effects. So it's a strange claim to say I went higher to get less refraction when in doing so you're actually going to generate more because you're looking through different atmosphere planes. Well, you can effectively see further, and that means because of the yeah the angle to it, but also means more air to look through exactly. And yeah, and when we talk about refraction in El Biruni, there was no such thing as terrestrial refraction with an R value in it. He was there to supposedly establish the radius of Earth without a conception of terrestrial refraction, and he was off. <laughs> He's measuring the geometry, so regardless of what they say in terms of him accounting for refraction, well, he's measuring geometry. So what his measurement requires is that the horizon be that tangent point that's later used in the maths. So that's what he's measuring. There's no two ways about what he's doing. He's doing a dip angle measurement to the horizon. Because why? Well, that's where the edge of Earth curve will be. That's the leading edge. Yeah, like like Adam said, it's it's an interesting claim that they do that. I mean, they're clutching at straws. They they can come up with anything. Their their uh, reasoning behind it is that um, you get the thickest layers at the bottom, yeah, and you're looking through what would be like uh, at more atmospheric effects, like uh, if you're looking above water or maybe some land that's giving off some heat. So if you rise up higher, you minimize the effects of refraction, which I don't agree with. Like you don't Adam, have like to, Adam explained it because they're, just, they're yeah. detailing atmospheric effects. Oh well, they'll need an R value for that, won't they? Exactly. So whenever the anybody starts detailing too. refraction, well, what kind of refraction? Does light refract? Yeah. What kind of refraction are we talking about when we detail it? over the curved surface of an earth that's spherical in your assumption oh well it would be atmospheric refraction wouldn't it <laughs> you'll need an r for that yeah sphere shaped air refraction yeah sure yeah i'll assume air's sphere shaped and has got these increasingly thick layers as you look over a curved surface that means that you're looking through more of it as it goes further away and dips away from you You've got more layers to look through. Therefore, you're going to have more atmospheric refraction because I've assumed atmosphere. I've assumed the air is sphere-shaped and that's the cause of light bending at a rate roughly the same as the sphere itself, so you don't really notice. Oh, really? How are you going to get the geometry measurements then? Because that's got sod all to do with anything optical. It's everything to do with the geometry. And if you're measuring geometry, you better damn well be looking at it. Oh, you can't see it. So how are you going to measure it? 
you can't is the answer. Al Biruni didn't measure Earth curve as a physical geometric sphere edge to get dip angle measurement to derive a radius. That simply didn't happen. Because the horizon, as I mentioned at the beginning of the show, we've only got one, and the horizon we see isn't Earth curve. The radius line from the circle of equal altitude of a star that's 4,000 miles away destroys that anyway. Because the radius line is straight. Yeah, it couldn't triangulate unless you had a flat plane beneath your feet and you could draw out a circle with a straight line to the edge of it. All of which points in one direction. That we've got a flat plane and we can triangulate with the stars assuming that there's a straight line meeting that flat plane at 90 degrees in every single direction. Well, that being the case, there's no other way of measuring it, navigating it, unless it's flat. Now, for all of your apologetics in terms of inserting our values and showing how it could be done, isn't how it's done. That's the bottom line. Same with the build stuff. They're not building on curved surfaces. And the I section suggests that the sky is flat too, right? That the It suggests it works in that manner. Further inference will not be tolerated. <laughs> I'm afraid not. Well, the zenith is the altitude, and that's always the 90, the plumb line. And it's got to meet something at the bottom to be called a perpendicular, and that's got to be a straight baseline of zero. And there's your right angle. And this is all within the language of celestial navigation. It's got to be perpendicular. The star's GP... What, what is that? That's not coming in from an angle. The GP of the star is when the altitude, it's at its zenith, the highest point in the sky. And straight down is located on the Earth. Straight down, that's a straight line. That's your 90. Uh, but you need something else for that 90, and they, you need that baseline. And that's why they uh, it's, it's got a perpendicular relationship to it. And this is all language within uh, all the Sexton books and manuals and videos I've I watched and read, and it was like, wait a minute, you're, you're saying you need the right angle, so that means the radius has got to be straight all the way to the navigator, so where's your curve? Well, there goes the curve, because you can't have an angle with a curved surface. Just takes a little bit of digging. anti flat earth earth symbolers. Uh, e. Simaholsky's in chat, he says 600 nautical miles are navigated flat. That might be the case, but in terms of the triangulation, Isa, e. it's far, far more Square miles or miles squared. Ah, you beat me to it. <laughs> Don't start. <laughs> if, uh, can I share just for a second, Nathan? Just you to are. Come back. Yeah, lovely. Um, what I've got on screen is the, the derivation mass for Alba Rooney, which we, we've mentioned is, is crucial uh, in terms of this room, the ball, or the, the theory of what he's doing and highlighting that we're measuring to a, a physical location. What, what it does, I think we're all familiar with that. What's quite interesting is you see there, he's got the, the mountain M. Um, and to know the height of that mountain is crucial. And he does some very, very clever mathematics, which I agree with, uh, to get the height of the mountain. And that's up here. But what he does is he basically pulls a sextant out and takes different measurements from different distances, known distances, to do it. Now, this is his base. This is his basic calculation that he's going to work everything from. But if you can see, this seems to be a slight problem here, because the way he's worked it out is to assume that the way to calculate the height of the mountain is to work on a flat base and not a curved surface, which is what he's about to then go and measure. So all of the initial calculations to calculate the height of the mountain are based upon the presupposition that he's measuring across a flat plane. Oh, I did not it's know that. I just read it and figured it out now. Oh, that isn't that priceless? <laughs> oh, so when you're going to measure off your correctional values for doing dip correction in actuality, it works the same way as his mathematics for calculating the height that he's going to start with oh how joyous so he even needs it to be flat absolutely brilliant yeah what it be is not subject to any curvature even though it's a distance from oh 
and the so same with A. So he's going to take a few known parameters, one of them being the flat plane that he's going to use. <laughs> <laughs> this is ace. Turn out the lights. The party's over. Classic. <laughs> they say that all good things should end. <laughs> look look at the base here to calculate the height and then look what he then puts it on. Huh. But his calculations come out here from a massive distance straight. So, yeah. Sorry, Uncle Bobby. Oh, dear. Oh, dear. Oh, dear. Oh, dear. The tangled web you weave. <laughs> Yeah. Nathan, to, to compliment Adam's picture, go to the one I just posted. In Master B? Yes. Okay, let's have a look. Good morning, guys. Good morning, Chuck. Chuck. The cartoon one. Hi, right, Chuck. Yeah, yeah. So here's a here's a vertical sex and breathing uh, offshore to, say, a lighthouse or a windmill, whatever. We'll call it a lighthouse. And you can see it's the same thing Adam is, is talking about. And there you got to have the circle of equal altitude as well uh, with the GP of the lighthouse coming out to where you are on that part of the circle and on the water, get your compass bearing with the azimuth, 300 degrees. And again, as you can see on the right side, the picture, you need that baseline, just like Adam just showed, even if you go the other way. Indeed. That, that picture Tom says is demonstrating how he would have got the height. That's the top of the mountain there, and that's what he's doing. Then he's going to go to a much further distance and take another angle and do flat planar trig to determine the height. Right, that's what we had to do at um, St. Bees Beach. It's just simple triangulation measurement, but by the same token, you've got to have a flat plane to do it. You, know, you can't not do it without it. <laughs> I think this is great. Why didn't we spot this before, Adam? Props. I was literally just flicking, um, and it is. It just popped up because you don't see that bit of maths. And I just saw that and thought, hello. That's not a ball we're starting on, is it? And then I've read the maths, and it is just, just trig, look. And then he goes... Even to presuppose ball. you're on a ball, you need to start with flat. Yeah. Well, that, that's the point. You'd have to, like, even if he did this, once he'd then figured out the, um, if there was a curve, he'd then have to go back and amend all his first measurements that told him the height of the island because A would be subject to a drop rate and B would be subject to a drop rate, wouldn't it? Because they're different distances. So there would be curvature playing out, which would pervert his measurements which would mean his measurements were wrong which would mean when he then applied those measurements to his geographic horizon they'd be wrong anyway because it, it would have been initially calculated on a flat plane not on the ball that he's working of and having to compensate for it's just bunker maths isn't exactly. it exactly it, ch it changes the value of the bottom part of his triangle for the first height measurement if he's assuming a chord i.e his bulge between him and then <laughs> the lighthouse or the mountain in this instance that he's measuring well obviously you haven't got a straight path you've got a curved path that would increase that line which completely throws all the measurements off but the bottom line is it's back to the triangulation in actuality he isn't doing that is he <laughs> he's actually doing it flat right he's not he's not back engineering his his presupposition that he's going forth to measure to derive r when he gets the height of the mountain he's just doing it flat Uh, it, it it doesn't surprise me though. Does it surprise you? Like when we found uh, Andrew Thomas Young talking about refraction, and then he says, "Well, obviously we've got to do all this across a flat surface." <laughs> you know, the geometric considerations are on page forty-seven. <laughs> you know, but for now, obviously we just do it on a flat surface because that's how it actually works. And in this case, when you're measuring heights of stuff, you know, you've got a straight line between you and the bottom of it. <laughs> that's just how it works and it works every time but then obviously once we've got those data points we can go forth and assume that we're measuring a surface that's curved it's really easy <laughs> so stupid when you when you realize what you've been deceived with all you can do is look back and laugh right but while i'm laughing my head off this is severe pain 
to our opponents, isn't it? This is really cognitively difficult to process. I'm sure there's a lot of people watching right now who are fundamentalist religious zealots in favour of a ball belief that they've lost some time ago and are now fighting the anti flat earth fight. <laughs> that they're going to go through this and go, what do we do? Something needs to be done. Surely he did actually back engineer his height measurement with a curved surface in mind. <laughs> no, he didn't, no. No, no, he just, just used what he had and that was flat. <laughs> Hey, Nathan, I got some more uh, picks in there in Master B. You can pour some salt on those wounds. Okay, so I've got your first, again, cartoony triangulation of a lighthouse. Is that what you wanted? Yeah, you see the guy with the sextant aiming at the lighthouse? Yeah, got beardy guy. Yeah, now go to the next one. You need that baseline, right? Yeah. You see the 90 degree there on the lighthouse? Yeah. That's the GP of the lighthouse, where it is over the earth. It's the same thing for the stars. Go to the next one. Your sailboat off the coast, lighthouse. Same thing, you need that 90, which is the GP of the lighthouse. And to create that baseline, to get the angle, just can't get an angle off a curved surface. And that's what a sextant is, angle measuring device. Next one, just another one. This one shows the, the 90 box. And then of course, you got to make your dip correction for how high <clears throat> you are above the water to get an actual correct read. We move on to the next, next one. one. See, see, this, yeah, this, see this little box here? At the bottom of this lighthouse what this box says is earth is flat that's what that box says that little 90 degree angle that little box that says this is at 90 degrees this is a square that says earth's flat that's what that symbol means that whole diagram's fantastic it's confirms exactly that mathematically that the way you're working out is on a flat plane and the only correction you've got to do to bring your triangle back look is that dip correction which is i think inappropriately described as the, <coughs> the dip correction it's the height you are above the water above the plane that you're taking all the measurements correction dip implies curvature to me and um, not what the actual correction is correcting for not labelled as anything other than H on this diagram. So what, what Adam's now describing is this measurement. So if you're on a boat and you're, a, I don't know, 100 foot above the water, probably wouldn't work in this scale. Let's make it a smaller boat. Let's say you're 20 foot above the water. Well, then when you're taking your measurement, the assumption that you've got a flat plane below you in order for this to work, I might as well say it as it is right, it must be a flat plane beneath you for this to work as opposed to it's an assumption. It just has to be. Well, that doesn't change the fact that you're above that surface, that flat line that you must have for this to work, you're above it. So when you actually take your measurement to the baseline of this lighthouse or the horizon if you're doing triangulation, then you've got to correct for the fact that you're now looking at a down angle across the flat surface. Likewise, if you're doing triangulation to measure a really long piece of wood and you've got up a ladder to do it, you'd have to correct that angle that you were then above that long piece of wood to bring it down to the level of the wood. Well, that's all it is. It's a height correction. Well, in sextant terminology, it's called a dip angle correction. Coincidentally, they've got a dip angle measurement for a physical horizon to give you radius. So the terms are the same. Now, what's being done is very different. In terms of the sextant, it's just minusing off your height to bring you down to the level of the flat plane that you must have to get this box at 90 degrees to the thing you're triangulating with, in this case, the light on the lighthouse. Yeah, that's true. Go to the next one, and we can read something here. Just, just, just before you, you you flick on that, just to exemplify the point, we're talking about a straight baseline, and the, the dip correction there, we were talking, say, 10, 20 feet, Nathan gave an, an example of, and that's the correction it puts in to keep the maths correct to triangles. If, say, that distance was 10 miles from the boat to the... then the curvature correction you'd have to put in uh, is something like 66 feet so you can see your 
the, the maths clearly describes to you that you are dealing with the height above the water. You are not compensating to correct your maths for a curvy surface. The correction is to bring it all exactly to a flat plane. Correct. And further to that, it's a simple correction. You're just adjusting for the height above the water or ground that you're measuring over, right? Now, there's no exp not exponential. There's no squared function to apply based on distance to the measured item. No, just a correction for height. Very simple. Do you want to carry on with the next slide, Tenth? Yeah, as you can see here, he's got uh, an image from the ocean view uh, of uh, some rock or island. And he has to bring the top of the rock to ocean level with the double reflected mirror of this accent. Go to the right of that, you see another one with the writing underneath showing a boat from a rock with a lighthouse, and it explains it. The reflected image must be brought down to the horizon, not down to the land or base of the lighthouse. So you're not gonna do the base of the lighthouse. The height of the light above sea level is given in the light list. So obviously, since you're near land, you refer to your chart books and it tells you the height of the lighthouse, the height of the cliff, and you're using that uh, for coastal navigation. But you still have to use that double image mirror, uh, reflected image, and bring that down just like you do the sun and do the rocking over the horizon in the ocean when there is no landmarks. And go to the last picture, and it shows it here quite well. So here we have a, a, a ship off the shore. Uh, he wants to know the distance so he can refer to his charts. He sees a lighthouse that's also listed in the chart. He gets the dimensions of the lighthouse. He brings the top of the lighthouse down to the bottom at sea level, okay? And there you get your 90, triangulation. So do you ballers or anyone who say you don't need 90 to use the sextant? You just walked into the biggest mess you ever walked into. Don't talk about that. Don't mention the 90. Shh. Good stuff. What's, what's the number after 89? 90. Oh, shh, shh. You guys are real smug. What's under my bed? Let's move on. Let's move on. Still have a couple of days we haven't made our way through housekeeping all the way. So, any scientific evidence of gravity? Uh, no. Don't mention 90. <laughs> We've passed that. <laughs> any single viable hypothesis from any of the fields of astronomy, cosmology, or astrophysics? It's more than likely you're going to need R for that, so no. More than likely, but until we actually get a viable hypothesis in the first place, we can't really accuse them of needing R for it. Keeping questions. Don't mention oh, can we stop the? Can we stop well, with the whispering? Hold on. I I popped on to Jim Panda's last night, like real quick, like thirty seconds quick, and they're still talking about traveling high enough to see the horizon curve. So I'm telling you, they just make believe the black swan don't exist. Out of sight, out of Wait, mind, you know. Well, have they figured out how high you have to go yet? Because they're still working on that, as far as I know. Every time you ask one of them, how how do you have to go to see the curvature? It's always like, oh, well, <laughs> it's always one of those <laughs> signal and I got dinner on the stove. and. <laughs> yeah, but the funny thing was you followed it up with just one of the many, many sphere earth proofs that we've been pounding the flat earth this way. I just had to laugh. Doesn't Neil... The grass say that stuff's flat. Uh, you can't get high enough. Yeah, listen to the yeah, uh, yeah. But he's he's trying to get you to fall into the same trap, which is to say that the reification of the horizon into a physical geometric sphere edge known as Earth curve. That's the magic trick. And I'll say it again. It's the third time in this show. We only have one horizon. 
and the horizon in the begging the question proof of nothing perspective hijacking earth curve calculator aka the earth curve model is physical and geometric it is required of it that it blocks things into the distance and has a drop value beyond it that requires it to be a tangent point that is the geometry of earth curve and we have debunked the horizon as earth curve the horizon is not earth curve now this is only just i think it was righteous force who said oh oh yeah so when they say it should be bending at high altitude that's the same exact horizon that you've debunked with the black swan then yes it is going up high and suddenly talking about whether or not you can see curvature is the reification of the horizon into earth curvature i'll say it once more the horizon is not earth curvature any evidence you can have gas pressure without the necessary antecedent of a container to press upon you're going to need three containers for that Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Any evidence you can have gas pressure without a container? No. Necessary antecedent. That sounds like a loaded question. <laughs> well, they claim that gravity has the ability to hold the gases on. What's that? <laughs> gravity? What's gravity? Exactly. Oh, we just covered this. Right, let's go back a couple of steps. Any scientific evidence of gravity? Uh, no. Any evidence of a self-perpetuating molten iron core at the centre of a presupposed spherical Earth? You're going to need that for that. You would need the spherical Earth for there to be a core in the, in the center of a spherical Earth. You know, nobody, nobody's going to talk about this or try to refute it or anything. Like, you know, day in, day out, the question gets asked. Nobody really pipes up for it. Can you explain to us why it's self-perpetuating? Or Okay. Can you explain why they, why, why you're, uh, wording it as self-perpetuating? Sure, because it's beyond the Curie point and therefore it shouldn't be generating anything unless it's got some sort of dynamatic effect. I it's self-creating this dyna dynamatic, I think is the right word. Uh, so self-perpetuating its own magnetic field beyond its Curie point where it shouldn't be doing that. Point being, they've possibly shown it to be done i think with lithium you can you, you can do it but i think fundamentally with, with regards to their claim that this core is presupposed uh, it core is molten iron now with nathan said that once it goes past the curry point that is the um bit that contradicts no knowledge that you lose all magnetism past that point uh, hence why it will then need to have some mechanism that's generating it because from no knowledge um their claim contradicts itself you can't have iron at that temperature and it have uh, a magnetic effect there's no other way they can explain the magnetic field is there in their that's model the point, mate. The, the, the the magnetic field that we know is there that we can all see with our compass that's what they attribute it to don't they? that's that's their just so story at the center of their presupposed yeah. ball is this thing that's given this thing that we know exists uh, but that's their just so story for why all right we might have a new guy that might want to add something Oh yeah, Here we go. 
Should we take him off? Oh, he, he's the one that disrupted shit. before. He wasn't sure he was hot miking, so you want to give him a chance, Nathan? Oh, sure. Legs. Is that right? Yes. Okay, you're right, me, guy. Hey, Lega. Right. Well, I tried. <laughs> well, well done for trying. <laughs> well, that concludes the housekeeping anyway, so at least we got all the way through it today. Been a while. Well, you trying to get that guy on has really killed the mood. Thanks for that, Righteous. Oh, jeez. Could have told you that. Uh, I'll interject with, uh, after, even after your conversation the other day with my coworker, that, the, <laughs> the, I don't know, it's like there's this block with some people that like, it's like you tell them something and they just aren't willing to accept it. Even though what you're talking about isn't subjective, you're not talking about feelings and emotions and how, what your idea of something is. You're talking about what is and what isn't. And then with science, you talk about cause and effect and it's like they don't want to understand it. It's like, <laughs> you know, it's, it's weird. Like I'm still having the same argument with her. It's crazy. <laughs> There was a there was a point I think when Nathan clarified. I'm not, not interested in what you think it is. I'm not here to argue with you. And that that seems to be quite a normie's response. They I think intuitively know they know it's not right, so they fill in some gaps themselves and give them their own their own version. And that was what that lady was trying to say. Yeah, yeah, I know that it's probably not right, but I think of it like this, which validates it for me. Yes, and that's half our argument all the time, is I think of it like this, and I think it, my idea of it is this, and it's like, okay, I understand that that's your idea, but we're not talking about your idea of what it is, we're talking about what it is. Objectively. And it's like, I don't know, it's weird. <laughs> it's the thing they do. And then I got like, after going through the whole thing with uh, between theory and scientific theory, and then it's like, she turned it around. It was just like, see, but the, what you don't understand about a scientific theory. And I was like, what the f are you talking about? <laughs> I just told you what it is. How are you going to tell me I don't understand? I was like, wow, this, understand that, that, understand, understand. that you don't understand thing is a real phenomenon, man. <laughs> I got to say, people really go to that when... They, they have nothing left to turn to. It's crazy. The difference you're highlighting is objective and subjective. They don't like objective. They don't want Ooh. truth. They don't want truth to be truth and everything else compared to it be a lie. They don't ever want that kind of world. They want, well, I look at it this way. Yeah, but that's not what it is. Yeah, but still, I want to look at it that way. But why is it you don't like objective only when the thing that you thought was objective no longer is? Now, all of a sudden, objective could be shaky. <laughs> what? But they can't handle flat. That's it. They cannot handle it being flat. Yeah. No, we it's, 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 yeah like, 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 we've been given this. Funny, like. Go ahead, Adam. Oh, just to yeah. quote, it was this three when we was watching that Neil deGrasse Tyson. Doesn't he have a quote for that chocolate in terms of, I'm not, go I'm not prepared to debate with people objective truths and yeah yeah i think he kind of highlights that, that that's what that's the war you're up against it's an objective truth to them even though they can't validate why but see that 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 statement right there especially from him right it's so chicken shit right because he fixed it up before, you know, he prefaced it with, oh, well, somebody could have it, you know, come on and debate and, and be full of uh, character and charisma and personality, right? And then, and then sub, uh, juxtaposed it with, with, with him having objective truth. And then he might actually lose a debate to somebody because that somebody might have more character or personality than he does, even though his objective truth should stand because... According to him, it's objective truth. 
no, but he's he saying that his objective truth might lose to somebody with personality. That's the that's the weakest position I've ever heard in somebody who declares they are a, a priest of science. This is ridiculous. And this is yeah, these are what you guys got. Yeah, but he basically said he's not going to debate anybody outside of the heliocentric debate. He's only going to debate in the heliocentric model. Oh, in Narnia, yeah. So to put that to the test, Chocolate, um, we have a car that's painted yeah. blue. And I come and I say to him, hey, I want to debate you on the color of this car. He says, no, uh, because, and how would he do it? How would he finish that off? Because, well, everyone, knows because... The cars. <laughs> everyone knows the color blue, right? That's the objective color of blue. Yeah, if you'd like, right. you're, you're going to be saying, nah, it's red. And he's like, I'm, objectively, I know it's blue, but I'm, I'm not prepared to debate you because, you know, you might have a bit of bants, sway the crowd. Yes. Even though it's objectively true, you'll convince them it's red. Yeah, your personality will overwhelm my objective truth. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's a good point. Well, yeah, I yeah. see it's projection. That's precisely right what he does. Actually, exactly. Uh, exactly what it is it's projection because he's the guy with the personality and the cool uh sun sunrise ties and all that shit telling witty jokes dropping mics right he's the guy with all the ca character and personalities uh, i mean if you like that type of shit i think he's a cornball personally but people like that right about him that's why he's all, always talking in front of audiences and he does you know all that shit right but he's the one with the objective truth so he has to portray it like he's got it and the other side is the one that's going to come all witty ridiculous so he's a priest what he says is unquestionable and he's making that out overtly clear so the way i see it is like well okay i'm not even going to preface it what your friend accepted was a grand delusion. Obviously, this is like so far from like this heliocentric model. Everything that we witness, everything that we experience is like exactly the opposite of what these people claim. And then they have justifications for why that is. That's a, a grand delusion that she's accepted. And I don't know many texts that speak to people who accept a grand delusion other than you know one the whole world well can, can i just give chocolate my interpretation of his co-worker which is to say that i don't see her as fighting in the same way we normally typically see here because she hasn't fallen down the hill yet right she's still on that hill unlike most of the people who come here so she's scrambling to to not fall down the hill <laughs> that's very different to having already seen what you've seen here and having to deny i mean she started to go through the motions but I've almost felt quite cruel. It's like, do you want to rob somebody of their blissful ignorance of this subject? Because in many ways, the people who don't know about it, it doesn't necessarily affect them in a negative way, in a perceivable surface level negative way. I don't want to get into the deeper implications of having a sphere earth belief. And the uh, yeah, I just don't want to get into that. I'm just saying that you shatter that person's illusions. You're basically forcing them down that metaphorical hill we talk about. When we say you get to the bottom and you can either fork off to the left and anti-flat earth and that means you've got to try and you know convince yourself that you're still at the top of that hill when you've fallen down it well for her she hasn't and i don't know that's a very different way of trying to fight a cognitive bias to keep it in place rather than have it shattered and try and put it back together again yeah i, I agree and she's i mean she's the same one that told me you know i i even though some of what you say makes sense, a lot of it, I, I can't accept it fully. And I don't think I ever could, because if what you're saying is true, then I don't know what else could be a lie. Everything else could be oh, a lie. Oh, dear. Oh, well, yes. then that changes she's things very that much. Uh, <laughs> then that changes things. That statement means she's an anti-flat earther then. Yeah. 
She's already contemplated it. She can't have made that statement unless she's contemplated it. That contemplation means she's fell down the hill. Say that yeah, again. Yeah, yeah. Say it again. What do you... That she she has told me that she well, what a lot of what we've discussed does make sense to her, but she cannot accept it because if she does, then she has to accept that her whole life is a lie, and she doesn't know what else could be a lie, could not be, and it would just completely destroy her. She'd been well, watching she's Conspiracy like... Cats. I, I was going to say he said almost the same thing, but she's dis she's already describing having done that cognitively. So what she's described is the antithesis of what she's described here live. So she's describing the other half of cognitive dissonance. To be able to make that statement, she has contemplated it, but it stands in direct contrast and opposition to what she must hold true. Right? Well, that's pain. Yeah. That's why she said what she said, which is what I picked up on. Yeah, in terms of ah, but I don't view it like that. So the only she she recognizes the contradictions, the failures in the heliocentric model. She can see the obvious truth out there, and yet she's keeping the ball with her own special theories and methodologies now. Exactly. Like that, I'll give you an example. A widespread, more common example would be Earth is claimed to turn underneath for 15 degrees an hour, and from the ground as we turn beneath it, we will observe it seem to drift. That's called Coriolis effect. That is the claim the globe makes. Now, when we as flat earthers point out to said globe believer at the top of that hill, high and mighty telling us how we've got Coriolis deflection and things drift away at 15 degrees an hour, obviously, because that's what the globe says, and we say, well, then Earth would be turning underneath your drone. And it's not. Earth would be turning underneath an aeroplane and that would shorten flight times when travelling west. And they don't have fl flights shortened when travelling west. Earth's not turning beneath anything. And then that same person who's formerly at the top of the hill, high and mighty because he knows things drift, because that's what the globe claims they do, and you're pointing out that they don't, they say... We shouldn't see drift because there's only one reference frame. Earth isn't turning underneath anything. And you go, that's actually kind of like my argument. But just with you retaining the idea that we spin at the same time, in contradiction of the actual claim that we'll see an effect when that happens, that would be drift. That you're telling me we won't see anymore? That's two positions being held in cognitive dissonance. And when I first started hearing that, I thought that might just be like a one-off, right? When Glovers, these Globe idiots started showing up here and we would go through that. And I would hear them make that switch. And I'm like, nah, I can't. Okay, maybe this is just this one guy. And then another guy would come in with the same crap. And then, you know, years later, now we're still being told the same shit. Now they're both saying it on the same side, both saying the same shit. It's it's insane, and I thought, wow, this is really like it's almost like an epidemic. <laughs> well, it's, it was certainly so... a pattern, and it was a pattern that I didn't know how to overcome in terms of argument. And I also gave credit where it wasn't due to the people doing it, because I thought, how is this person mentally capable of doing these acrobatics on the fly, and and still sounding like they believe what they're saying, even though they're in contradiction to the thing they said 25 seconds ago? How are they doing that mentally? And I thought, wow, they must just be really sharp. <laughs> later did i realize how wrong i was no actually in cognitive pain actually tr those acrobatics are painful to perform on the fly and having to be done in real time isn't something that you would wish on your worst enemy so back to our favorite movie why does everyone act like is his name Piper versus just being neo you're really muffled eli Why, why do my check? Yeah, you just really muffled. I don't know if you got. Sounds like you got a blanket over you or something. Is that just me? No, he's muffled. I heard. I, I heard favorite movie, so I'm assuming he's going to make a Matrix example. Yeah, can can someone finish it for me? Uh, Neo versus uh, the guy that wants wants the uh, the stake. Can't hear him. He's can't talking about out. Cypher taking the deal for the stake. Can someone finish that for him? He's asking. I don't know what point he wants to make, though, do I? So how can I make it for him? 
<laughs> you don't have to. You don't have to T-bone the question right away, Nathan. Oh, okay. Cipher gets a, a juicy stake because he's promised that he can get reinserted into the Matrix. Metaphorically, I would draw a parallel between him wanting to go back into the Matrix and somebody who's already in the cognitive dissonance contemplating the lies that must be part of their world if they realise that the thing that you've just explained that cannot not be true is true. Uh, yeah, at that point, that Cipher sat with the stake being offered to go back into the Matrix. The problem is, metaphorically speaking, you can't plug back into the globe model. It is impossible. Once you've contemplated it, like this person we're discussing, you can't undo or unsee or unhear what you have heard. Yeah, perfect. My, if you want so to enjoy the fine why... things in life, then you will get the you know what. But, but the but the bottom line is that it's it's crazy how many ciphers there are out there. Because I've wondered initially. Wow, how does this person know how to argue like, you know, one of the people that we've spoken to here? And it's because they realize that what you're telling them is true and they're they are deliberately trying to uh maneuver around it because they know they see what you see. They're yeah, and they'd have to accept deliberately it. Deliberately trying to maneuver. Yeah, so if they've heard a previous person argue that you can have no drift and explain why there's no drift, when a flat earther points out there's no drift, explain why there's no drift. Don't apologise for the fact that you're supposed to have it. Don't contemplate that the globe claims you will have it. Just explain why we haven't. And that's what they'll do. They'll go through the motions of doing what they've seen someone else do because that's the reasonable response to give when your claim doesn't pad out. You're supposed to have drift and you don't. What's your answer? Here's why we don't. Well, you're supposed to have it, though. But here's why we don't. And so you go round and round in circles with somebody who's explaining to you why you don't see drift when the claim is that you do. Now, that person who's explaining that projects all of their cognitive dissonance straight onto their opponent. And back in the day, it was very frustrating. Now, you know, no, that's just a person in cognitive dissonance. They've sh you've shown them that their claim doesn't pad out. If we had drift, we'd see drift. It's very simple. If Earth was spinning and we had Coriolis effect, we'd observe it. And we don't. So once you've explained that to them, if the person contemplates it and says, yeah, but if I accept that, that means that they've lied to me about there being spin. Or they can say, no, we wouldn't expect to see drift underneath. And then they have a little malfunction and a little short circuit. Nathan, Eli. After a while. Mute, mute up, Eli. Um, yeah, Eli Nathan, making a lot of noise. On that point right it's the morosophy of why um the earth shouldn't exhibit any why we shouldn't feel any effects of the spin even though it's spinning and it's that knowledge that foolish knowledge of why we shouldn't experience it even though we are doing that uh, that reinforces the cognitive dissonance from yeah so it, it, it empowers the cog this. I know all about why it shouldn't we shouldn't feel it spinning even though it's spinning. Therefore, it proves that it's spinning. Yeah, but it's worse because they're saying, I know how I can explain why we don't see drift. Now, as a flat earther, my reply now is what the drift the globe claims we should see. Now, formerly, you might have seen the Kosho versus Blue Marble or Kosho versus Blue Marble and Simon Dan, who both forward positions of no drift. We wouldn't expect to see Earth turning under a hot air balloon. Here's an example of a man not drifting from his trampoline. So here's our explanation for no drift from anti-flat earthers who think they're globe believers. It's like, no, cognitive pain. Go ahead. No, but that, that, yep. that's the point. It's that morosophicness of the why you're not experiencing drift, even though it's drifting in their mind. That's that understanding of that bullshit knowledge, that foolish knowledge, yeah, that they say because we've got lockstep different and um, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. It's that bit of knowledge that empowers the cognitive dissonance because they know that foolish knowledge. It supports their 
the the cognitive dissonance side, which is it puts it in the plus column. No, I'm I'm right to keep thinking this way because I've got this bullshit knowledge about why something that definitely happens isn't happening. Right, it's- and that and that is what our opponents specialize in. So their job, this would be Craig and Dan and Cats and Dave and all of these cartoon characters. Their sole purpose is to feed the cognitive dissonance of ex-glow believers who would prefer to retain normality because their normality isn't real anymore and they need an excuse for it to be real. So that's a market that needs filling. Then if you push them long enough, you can actually get them convinc- uh, get them to admit that planes must fly backwards. Yeah. Yeah, you can get them to admit all sorts of crazy, contradictory nonsense because they're fighting for a rebuttal against their original claim in the case of drift. We're supposed to see things drift. It's Coriolis effect. Everyone's heard of Coriolis effect. We're supposed to see the effect. Now, we as Flat Earthers say, we don't see that effect. It doesn't happen. And they go, we don't see that effect happen because, as opposed to, yeah, we do, like the globe says we do. But they can't because it doesn't. So what they're going to do? They, what they do I, I is they just... Do- say that this, this is what they have to do. Like, I mean, Kosho is the same guy who said... The, ge- the geometric horizon is the horizon you wouldn't expect to see, right? So when they know you don't see anything that that's claimed to be seen by their model, they say, well, we don't expect to see it. And then they'll ask you for a citation, show me where it says I'm supposed to see it. And then when you show it to them, it's like, well, just because you don't understand that, <laughs> it's like, what? <clears throat> that's, well, how do you, you measure it if you haven't seen it? Well, that's the Earth curve we're talking about now. So we're talking about the claim that you can see a physical geometric sphere edge obstruction and based on there being a physical geometric sphere edge obstruction at their horizon, which they formerly called Earth curve before we debunked it with the black swan, would have a value for drop and hidden. Now, those values would be ascribed to how much the physicality has blocked what's behind it. Well, when you point out that it's beyond the physical geometric limitations of a sphere Earth and that the horizon is not Earth curve blocking your view, they say, we wouldn't expect to see Earth curve. In other words, explain why we're not seeing the very thing they claim to prove we're on a sphere. Or, with spin, the thing that we're supposed to observe to prove we're spinning, we're not seeing it. And in the case of the image on screen, the black swan, we're not seeing an Earth curve horizon... That isn't what's on this image. So the horizon's not Earth curve. Enter the anti-flat Earth apologist to tell us why we don't see Earth curve and how we wouldn't expect to see Earth curve. And allowing it... And then they break down and say that you can't leave any uh, reference frame or that you're in all reference frames all at once. That, yeah, that's another one. That's another one that it's all doing the same thing, isn't it? Like we're highlighting it. They're, they're taking the accepted contradiction and then validating it with morosophic knowledge. Well, of course we wouldn't expect to see that physical thing because of blah, 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 blah. Yeah, or of course we wouldn't expect to see a, th- a second reference because of blah, blah, blah. Nonsense, morosophic stuff that then underpins their cognitive dissonance and allows them, Nathan, to rattle it off like that. Yeah, because that's how the cogdis works. It has to be reified that you go from A to B with that bit of nonsense because that's how you respond to it. But it underpins their cogdis. And each time, all those situations, you, you're highlighting they're doing the same thing. We accept the contradiction, but we then give a load of waffle that allows us to stay in the, the paradigm. And waffle is morosophic in its nature. And on that morosophic note, I'm going to say if you are watching this on either Nathan Oakley 1980 or Nathan Oakley Premiering Streams, then stay tuned as there will be an after show to follow. Unfortunately, if you are watching this live, this is where we bid you farewell. So a huge, massive, enormous thank you to all of you who smashed the super chat, liked, commented, shared, subscribed, joined as a Nathan Oakley 1980 channel member, smashed the PayPal link and all that good stuff. Also, below this video, you can get £50 for swapping your UK electricity supplier to Octopus Energy. 
I've been Nathan Oakley. Stay tuned if you're watching on a premiering stream and I will see you all in the next video. Everything above flat earth and then when people in between him and i say well you know 10th man wants to talk to you no 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 so he backs out every time but behind the scenes we're crazy anyone that has a these kind of questions about the nature of our earth and he's just afraid to find out just like your co-worker the cog disc is keeping up you know what's funny like i tell her shit that uh, i've heard or has been told to us here and other places right and then she'll laugh she'll be like nah nobody said that like the, what i told her the other day i was like you know why most of these guys say that uh, all right i prefaced it with well let me ask you this why does a helium balloon go up and she said well it's, it's lighter than the air and i said okay i, I can do i can deal with that answer that that's cool do you know why, you know what they, what the Globers that we argue with, they tell us why that's mm -hmm. happening? She said, why? I said, well, they say that the helium balloon is going up because gravity is pulling all of the other air around it down. And she laughed at me. She was just like, nah, <laughs> that's ridiculous. Don't, they don't say that. They don't say that. And I was like, I guarantee you, I've heard it plenty of times. Are you kidding me? Right? So she didn't believe that that's what they would say. But then she, that, that's how we ended up in the conversation. Cause then she tried to say that, oh, how gravity is a theory. And I was like, well, that's nice, but it's definitely not a scientific one. And that's where it became oh, the difference between a theory and scientific theory. So then after the whole thing, which she didn't even know what a scientific theory was or the difference between that and a colloquial theory. I mean, we had to go to the definitions that she had looking up colloquial, <laughs> you know, like it, we went through the whole shit. And at the end of it to tell me, oh, just because you don't understand how gravity is a scientific theory. <laughs> I was just like, OK, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm done with you because that's ridiculous. I just so, taught you what the fuck it is. And then you're going to tell me, I don't understand how it is that. Okay. <laughs> what What is it you're doing with your mic? Because when she was talking, it didn't have that sound. Someone in the comments said it sounded like you're rolling dice. Who, me right now? Yeah. Are you playing CeeLo? No, well, well, when I gave her the phone, I, I have uh, headphones. But when I gave her the phone, I put it on speaker. Uh, and I took the headphones out. Are but they, me uh, right now, I have the headphones on. Are the headphones is it making a sound have you got the mic yeah so uh, the mic's hitting something as you're moving around maybe i think oh it might be when i let it go it, uh, when i'm talking right now i'm holding it don't to my mouth. you don't need to don't do that no so this is cool right here just leave it alone well alone and then okay. that's what's making the noise i was gonna that was gonna be my next question are you picking it up oh. and holding it can you hear me now like, this is cool yeah but there's less handling. Okay. It's just handling noise. Oh, okay. it's your grabbling starting to leak through the noise. The noise. But, but you know what? Leak. Sometimes I I walk around when I'm working and stuff, and then I'm next to machines that make a lot of noise. So I'm trying to just minimize the noise for the show. But if you're saying that causes more noise, then I'll try to show. Come I think, on, yeah. Chuck. Right now I'm in yes. I'm in a quiet place right now, so it's cool. Come on, come on, Chuck. <laughs> Let it rest at equilibrium. Come on, don't pick it, it up. It, if it's if it's brushing against <laughs> something, <laughs> I, it, you Stop just have to. Stop touching your mic. Yeah, you, it's brushing against something and making a noise. But you just listen back. You'll hear it, and then you just figure out whatever it is when you listen back to this. It's, it's the same problem I had. It's, it's brushing up against his shirt or something while he's working. Yeah, just yeah, just get a blanket and shove it over it like Eli's done. <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean? Hear everything like Eli? That, that's curry chicken. That's curry chicken. Eli's got not blanket.
Sorry, I didn't mean to kill the mood with a technical thing. <laughs> Somebody in the comments <laughs> literally said. Chocolate, chocolate, she wants you to stand under what she's believing. So really, you're not standing under what she believes or wants you to believe. That's what she's basically saying. Stand under this belief. But I'm saying, but here's the thing, right? If all of this, if everything that I was telling her was leading it to the conclusion of we live on a ball, I don't think she'd have any problems with it. That's that's the distinction, right? But because she knows everything I'm gonna say is gonna lead to, it's definitely not what we're told it is. So everything I say is a problem. Because if I if I believe we live on a ball and I told her gravity is not a scientific theory, she'd probably go with that and be like, okay, that's cool. But whatever it is, at the end of the day, it's still a ball. So I don't care if gravity is a scientific theory or not. But because I'm not a baller, she has to tell me how gravity, which is a scientific theory, even though I just had to go through what a scientific theory is with her so that she can understand the difference between a theory, colloquial, and scientific one. And at the end, she, 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 she's, she's just like, yeah, you don't, you don't get it. We like, okay. use another method. <laughs> One of the many methods. Anything but flat. Anything, Anything but, but flat. flat, yeah. yeah. Funny. Well, since uh, Eli dropped his mic into the curry sauce, is he going to start hot micing anytime soon? Yeah, you've been waiting for that for a while, eh? Yeah. It was late in that, Kumin. That, that, it was late in Kumin. Let me correct you. Curry is not hot. It's spicy. There's a difference between spicy food and hot food. You answered that very gingerly, Neil. Yeah. Thank you. Your mic sounds like it's coming. It's on the other side of the room, Neil. Because I'm on a construction site and I'm in a wide open area with no walls and no nothing. Okay? Meanwhile, I sound absolutely crystal clear and beautiful. That's why I you could have just showed her the, uh, the the quotes that show that it's not a force. You could have just shown her that. But we we covered this earlier. Chocolate said that whenever something like that came up, she just said, "Well, I interpret it to mean." Yeah, yep. don't you know they're allowed to think of it as a force, so they will damn well take that opportunity. <laughs> I should have pegged her as a, an anti-flat earther quicker because she started going round in circles and chanting. Yep. <laughs> so I, I knew it was going to be a fun combo. Well, I, I like the part that she admitted to chocolate. If she has to admit that this is a lie, what else is what else isn't a lie? So based on this, she thinks everything else is a lie, which is ridiculous. Because if someone is her friend and tells her i love you as a friend is that a lie now is no, everything no, no. a lie because they lied about heliocentrism no. no well yeah but in the wider field of things I, I i totally appreciate where she's coming from right because the contemplation of how far that might reach is scary it's the same as i don't know if you went back to the 1950s or something and started explaining to somebody that not everything you read in the newspaper is correct now there are masses of people that if you try to explain to them well just because they've said that's true and the person that's told them has said it's true doesn't mean that what they're reporting on isn't complete lies you know people lie and that gets printed didn't you know that and they're like no it's written it's down effective. it's documented risk. exactly so you're trying to break somebody's paradigm that what they think is the world around them as it is actually could be very different to how you're interpreting the words that are explicit in terms of what they're saying. It just could just be lies. Now, some people just have a real meltdown when you tell them that. Yeah, the news could actually lie to you. Same goes for BBC, CNN, ITV, ABC. All of them can throw up on screen and say verbally, looking directly to camera, a complete inaccuracy or lie. Correct. Now, that's... Well, the... Uh... If I could, uh, real quick. Go on, Eli. Go on. Yeah, it's well. <clears throat> when someone asks, well, if if I don't, if I accept this, I won't know what else is a lie. Well, you don't want to be responsible for your own autonomy, though. Yeah, people All don't. Need to do... People don't. Absolutely correct. They don't want the responsibility. Yep. Yep. 
that's it. It's sad, isn't it? That's why to some this is joyous. Oh, wow, the world's my oyster then. Wow, there's a lot of things that could actually be discovered. Wow, that's exciting. Maybe I'll be the one to discover them. Mmm, cool. Or, what do you mean we don't know? Well, you must tell me immediately. And when you tell me, I'll contradict how you think it is in favour of a false dichotomy model that will be held up as true if you get it wrong. So, quick, quick, tell me what it is. And, okay. and that turned to a T. Tell me Look. what it is. I need to know what it is. And because you don't have an alternative to hand me, uh, you know, a nice, cool new teddy bear to hand me to replace the one you just took away from me, I cannot accept what you're saying. That's like right. literally a direct they... quote from her. <laughs> and when they straw man you, they never get the straw man model conception, what they think you think right. They never get it right. It's always so off. It's like an insult. Yeah, it is. Look, when, the, when, when you turn on the news and it's the sports segment on the news, and it's giving you the score of a football match, a tennis match, whatever. Oh, okay, so-and-so lost or that team lost to that team. Okay, now you're not, I'm not saying the news is lying there, but then there's other parts that the news is lying. So they got, they, they know this. They know governments lie and sometimes tell the truth. They know the media lies and sometimes tells the truth. So when it comes to flat earth, the cognis is so strong because they know they're going to have to take responsibility that they are fighting to take. They don't want the responsibility of this knowledge because if this knowledge is allowed then everything changes for them. They have to stand up. They have to be strong. They have to tell all their friends, oh, I don't want that rejection. I don't want to be looking like a nutcake, so I'll fight it. Yeah. They're going yeah, yeah. this in their head. Yeah, the normie globy that we describe, not anti-flat earther, re instantly recognises what they'll be losing out on, how stable things seem when they just lived in the lie, how easy it is to just go on with life without particular concern being attributed to it. Now you're saying, I've got to be cognizant of all the other things that might be lies. I, I just walk around and with my, looking at my phone screen, not really worrying about any of that stuff. I don't want to worry about any of that stuff. Give me an alternative because then I can stop worrying about it. Interestingly enough, though, these same people, hang on, Chaka, please. Interestingly enough, they'll do that on the flat earth uh, topic, but when it comes to politics or something else, they're very opinionated and they'll even say the government's lying. Then I just look back and say, how come you didn't believe me when I said the school books were lying? How come you don't believe me when your senses tell you were not spinning? How come you're not applying this kind of wisdom right now? Because they're you know, already that... lying about everything else. They got to be saying the truth about that part. Yeah, exactly. And if they are lying, well, then we need to knock on their door and demand they tell us the truth. <laughs> right? <laughs> Give us the truth, NASA. Tell us what the sky really is. So all of a sudden, you're going to go back to a lying source and ask them to tell you the truth when they've been lying for hundreds of years? i tell you what I will do. Yes. I'll refer to them whenever I need to feed my own cognitive bias in my own directions and see what they've got to offer in my direction. No, I'm going to tell you what it is. We're like the kid now in a Truman show that had his dream ripped out that everything was discovered. We realize it's not. There's stuff out there that we can discover. Happy days. Yeah, I agree totally. It's a great analogy. The map gets pulled down by the teacher and she says it's all been discovered. No, you can't be an explorer. Well, that's devastating to that kid. Well, once you find out that that's actually not as it might appear, then suddenly the world's your oyster. A world of wonder. Or a world of... Um, not knowing and confusion and that's terrible to some people they, you know they, they need a model and there's plenty of people in society that will step in with the latest and greatest model for you to follow and that is considerably easier and most people will inevitably fall into the exact same pattern so while there's people out there that want to wake up the world and let them know the deceit it's like what on earth gives you the impression that there won't be some other character to step into the fray with a new model 
and everyone will flock to them. I absolutely guarantee it. Therefore, why argue with any of them? Because for those who have eyes to see, they'll see. And they'll utilise that newfound knowledge or recognition of deceit in whatever way best benefits them. And the ones who don't, won't. And will follow the next guru with the next model. And there's no hope for those people. Those are the people that we normally fight with. Because they're already rolling down the hill and they need someone to cling on to. It's like, ah, bugger off. <laughs> Why should I tell you anything about anything? You know, it's fascinating to me. But do I feel in any way obliged to give you this information to save you from your cognitive pain? No, I don't. I don't feel obliged at all. Yeah, there's another element, though. It's called pride. Uh, it's interesting that the people I've shared uh, FED with, uh, they're on. I mean, they're just saying, wow, this is great information. This is, I'm, I'm going to go tell my friend. I go, well, be careful. Make sure you understand the arguments first, but spend a little time, then do it. But here's what's going to happen. And I tell them what's going to happen. Some of them will see what you saw, and others are going to fight it because, you know, the cog this. And then uh, he says, yeah, but I got it the minute you told me. And I said, no, I know you got it because you didn't have pride in the way. He said, what do you mean? I said, well, if you were prideful, you would have said, how come he's telling me this? I uh, just make me look dumb. So I don't want to look dumb. So I'll fight it. Did you do that? He said, no. He says, well, I didn't think you were, there's nothing to be prideful. You were just sharing some truth with me. And I go, I know, but not the rest of the people are like that. It's like, so of course, yeah, I get a call later. Hey, I, I just had a talk with my brother. Man, he, he's so prideful. He's so. <laughs> yeah, it's, it is that pride. I agree. And that pride leads them to that realization of, oh shit, I don't know what I'm saying right now. And I don't have an, a coherent response. So the best thing for me to do is tell them that they don't understand it either. Right, but why is that pride there though, you know? The pride is there because they don't want to take responsibility for the realization and the splitting yeah. off of what they believed in. That's why they yeah, end but, up defending it, because they can't take responsibility for the discovery of it. That's also yeah, that intellectual investment. That authority has been taken from when you were a kid, when they implanted this crap in you. That's why you've probably heard me say it before. I, I, I take back my authority over my senses and my what I regard as reality to me. I'm taking that back. <laughs> I'm sorry. You're, you cannot assert your nonsense to be my reality anymore. And that bothers people. Like, sometimes it bothers my, my coworker. Like, I don't come in as a flat earther and just say, hey, it's flat and everything, you know, like a, like a psycho. Sometimes I don't even bring it up. But it's brought up to me because I'm the one that's on the outside. I'm the one that doesn't, uh, I don't flow. I don't, I'm not going with that flow. So that's always in the, it just seems like it's always in the back of my, uh, the heads of, you know, the people here that know I'm a flat earther. Right. So it has you, to planted come up. The, you planted the seeds and now the seeds get blown around even if you stop planting them. Yeah, but that's, yep. that's, <laughs> that's not necessarily true for what we're calling anti-flat earthers, because I think for a lot of them, there's a certain amount, um, amount of intellectual investment. And often people don't, we talked about money earlier, it's poetic irony the investment that people recognize normally is a financial one how much money have i spent on this item whereas with certainly philosophies like heliocentrism certain people will invest a lot of time into figuring out how certain aspects of it work the mathematics of gravity and once they've got their uh, intellectual fix in that regard it's something that they can ascribe intellectual value to when discussing it with other people you know, I understand this stuff really well, that has value to them. Now, if you try and take that value away from them, it's like trying to take money off someone else who subscribed their value to only things of finance. So the, the information in this regard is is of value to the, the anti-flat earths we deal with. So, for instance, I think Simon Dan is like, teaches some sort of astrology or something like that you know he's giving telescope lessons but ultimately speaking he's got a certain amount of intellectual investment in the subject matter that also in that particular instance develops a certain financial reward also so those sorts of commitments potentially if you're 
tied to them with enough pride, as Tenth Man's pointing out, could be fought for on a level that is difficult to comprehend for someone who doesn't have any intellectual or financial attachment to this horseshit of heliocentrism. It's just, well, all right. All right, so they said it was like that, but it's actually like this. That's fascinating. Well, not to the person that's down the pub telling their mates how wonderful they are because they know all about how Saturn's rings work in a heliocentric mindset. You know, for that boring bastard, of which I was one at one stage in my life, you know, that's a certain amount of intellectual investment that you might not necessarily want to get rid of. Well, the the point I'm trying to bring also is the the human... Uh, how can I put it? Hey, well, let's just tell the story. So there's a couple. Uh, the wife now sees flat Earth as the possibility that's the real reality. Brings it up to the husband. The husband can't handle it because of cog this and starts poo-pooing the idea. The wife says to the husband, well, you know the person, so why don't you go talk to him, debate it out, and see if you have any winning arguments against the points he's making. No, 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 that guy's crazy. I'm not going to talk to him. And I don't want you to talk to him or talk to me about it anymore. So this is uh, just one scenario of, of, of people I know. The other scenario is uh, the guy and his wife are still ballers, but some arguments were given to them through someone else that I inspired. And then they, then that person said, well, why don't you take on these arguments head on and disprove it so we can all go back to the ball. And, and again, same response. No, no, no. It's a waste of time and it's silly and, you know, it's obvious the earth is a ball. Oh, so you're afraid to do it was the, the, the counter back from this third party person. And basically the admission was bad. What are you afraid of? Set me straight. Set me straight. Don't you care for me? Yeah. But they're afraid to look bad. That's why at some point, like it's happened a lot, especially with re really regular normies, like it's happened a lot on 24 seven. At some point they get to uh, uh, the stage where they're like, well, I'm not a scientist and I, I don't know, but all the scientists out there, they know, right? That that's, it's almost like right at the, around the corner from you just, just cause you don't understand. It's the same shit. Well, I'm not a scientist. That's them saying, I don't understand. And basically you don't understand either. Well, it's the misconception of science, too. Remember that thing I was reading the other day, how the, the guy's saying the weather proves flat, uh, flat Earth is not correct, and he goes into gravity and all this other nonsense. The misconception of what science really is. But back to where you're saying that the person will just hand wave dismiss it because they're not a scientist and therefore they can't explain it. There are plenty of people, like I've just described, that have what I call an intellectual investment in this subject matter that do consider themselves professors in the subject and will label themselves such and then go around telling you all about how valuable their intellectual investment was and we stand in challenge of that so therefore well not just they don't understand they don't understand and i can explain it to them now when they come here with their uh, you know cocksure attitude that they can set us straight because we just don't understand but they can definitely tell us and they do and we point out how that isn't actually correct they'll just ignore it they'll go through the same process over and over again because how could they be wrong the whole point of them being here is to correct us right we're not setting them straight in their rhetoric that they thought was right they were here to tell us how it was right not be corrected that wasn't the intention Sounds like our good friend why Danny didn't, Faulkner. Why didn't it fight the tight shirt tell George Mooser that he doesn't understand how gravity is a force? Why did he just cower when 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 George Georgie Mooser told him gravity is not a force? Literally, right? Why why didn't he tell him? You don't understand. I mean, he's the one out here fighting the flat Earth, right? Out here touting this crap. But you didn't tell your priest when you had your priest on the live stream after he tells you gravity is not a force. After you spent how much time telling us, the crazy flat earthers, that it is a force, he tells you it's not a force, but you don't argue with him. You didn't tell him you don't understand, but you got to tell us that. Right. Well, he smiles and nods when, well, he was when given, that happened. He was given certain permissions. He was saying, obviously, you can still think of it as a force. He gave him a certain permission that wouldn't in, in, 
tail a challenge following it. Well, we got our good friend. We got our good friend Danny Faulkner, who went to flat Earth conventions, wrote a book, goes on other formats, but won't debate a flat earther. I said I got the answers. <laughs> Just because you don't understand, I, you don't have the answers. I got the answers. I got all the flat Earth answers. Uh, following, uh, what was it? The flat Earth conference. Uh, Nathan Thompson, how do you have gas pressure without a container, Mr. Danny Faulkner? Crickets. Thought you had the answers, Mister. You even have a book named Flat Earth Answers or some crap. <laughs> Are you serious? It's oh my God. But, but you see, Nathan's point is well taken. Look how much investment uh, Dr. Danny Faulkner has. I mean, he, he's he got to defend it. He's got to still have some uh, importance in life to have a name to sell a book. He can't, he can't go for the truth here. He's got too much investment on a lie that he doesn't want to admit is a lie round out that Danny Faulkner story so after the fact Danny Faulkner then being challenged and not being able to come up with an answer and given that he stated quite clearly that he had all the answers he went forth to try and find one and he found one from Blue Marble Science in a video titled Gas Pressure Without a Container and in the video he had two containers but because Danny Faulkner's a headline reader he took that video to actually be a demonstration of gas pressure without a container when it definitely wasn't, but he cited it. What an idiot. Wah, wah. Classic. I, I just want to say he, he didn't have to lie, but I, I mean, it's worse than that. He chose to accept the delusion. For the sake of his worldly things, of course. As if he could take that beyond the grave. Good for you. How could it be gas pressure without a container? Hello, everyone. How could it be gas pressure without a container when there was already gas pressure inside and outside the pipe of 14.7 psi? Yeah. Or to, to put it a different way in terms of how we would phrase it to a person that was putting the argument to us here and now, we'd say, how, where'd you get the gas pressure from in the first place? Uh, yeah, I mean, inside the pipe, before Blue Marble Science blocked up one end and then pumped in a more dense, um, a more dense gas, there was already air at the same gas pressure as what was outside. So you pumped in this more dense gas, and all it did was create a density and pressure gradient, but there was no need for the pressure at the top to equalize with the outside pressure because it was already equalized. Because it was all, it already had, it was already, it already has gas pressure in it before he did anything. When you say in it, by it you mean the, the container he used for the demonstration? Yeah, the container, yeah. Yeah, just to reiterate, this was a demonstration labeled gas pressure without. A container. We're, we're obviously arguing the whys and wherefores of the details of the containment he used. And sort of, it's worth reiterating that we're talking about the container, aren't we now, Brian? Yeah, I mean, I mean, the, there was already gas pressure there, and he used a container that was a pipe, and he blocked up, a container were open at two ends, then he blocked up one end and made it more, he actually made it more of a container than it already was. Yeah, he had a and leaky he, container. And he, brought, and he brought the gas in the container. Yes. So, Gas Pressure Without a Container was the title. Actually, transference of gas pressure from one container to another container was the actual demonstration. I have all of these. Um, and, um, I got a new mic. How's this one? Miles better. All right. So, my thing is... All these quotes that I found about everything else, I would love to find a handful of quotes where people in academia are actually questioning the void of space, aka the vacuum bit. Like, I, is there any anything like that? Anybody? Know? No, they won't come near us. What we're left with is the anti-flat earthers with their anti-globe and anti-flat rhetoric, and the 
academia of the arena is non-existent. I have seen, uh, I did say before several times about a video of seven different physicists, uh, I didn't say that word right, uh, who, who are, had different theories on what the sun was, and they said it couldn't be what we're told. Uh, and that was a good few years ago now. That was back a good few years ago. And there was a lady who was a physicist I saw back in 2014 who laid out, I, could actually, I wish I could find her video again. She laid out very, very straightforward arguments how what we're told about the sun and the size of it and, and what it's supposed to be. It can't be. You know, yeah, but I, I never found that's, it again. That's kind of, that, well, that's all right. It's just like the um, that other guy, I forget his name, the one that... uh did a response to Professor Dave, who said he didn't know anything about physics. Professor Robert um, Yes, but they're not actually challenging the uh, current acceptance that space is void of material. They're not, they're not challenging that. I'm wondering if anyone's saying, hey, we're talking about a ball of plasma or gaseous plasma and did, did anyone notice that it's supposed to be surrounded by a vacuum? Like, I don't, where is that at? Huey's channel. Well, they, they, yeah, they, 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 yeah. they, <laughs> they, That's right. they, they do when they start talking about the sun, because the sun is the start of their, is the very start of their model for the rest of the sky. All the stars are based off what they believe the sun is, because they believe the sun is a star. So once they change that, then that has to change every, every other part of it. I think it's too early. Well, you say, oh, where are they questioning it? When you listen to Quantum Eraser's origin story, as much as he professes to be embarrassed about it, it's typifying what you're asking. Why haven't they? Well, because none of them have considered it. It might not be that it's their field to consider it, so it isn't considered. And for the fields that are working with the mathematics of Einstein, for example, they just work within the confines of the mathematics that they're using. And when they scroll it out on a whiteboard and say, wow, isn't it wonderful to come up with the nature of reality? And then, they, you know, they shake each other's hands and go and get a cup of coffee. You know, that's just, that's their realm. Now, are we intertwined with them? No, we're kept separate and occupied with people who have fallen down the hill and are now going, oh God, if I accept what you say, even though it's right, I might have to contemplate that there's a lot of other lies out there. Oh, wait therefore, a minute. I, so, oh. I was going to say, therefore, you're wrong. Therefore, the person that's telling you about this thing that isn't in any way refutable can't be accepted because you're just wrong and obviously Earth's still a sphere. I just accept that. Listening to the, you know, this conversation, I'm beginning... I, I've already had these ideas, but now the people in academia that are supposed to be on our side that would which is really the truth it's not a side it's hey i'm questioning this well i i think that people realize when they get there that there are issues and either you're going to go against the grain or you're just going to go and whatever so my idea is that these people are being insulated from us by the media because qe was able to run into this question well, these people, they're running into the straw man, so they never get the they never get the questions that we're offering here. That's the problem, because every time I talk to a normie, they want me to address what's on Google. And I'm like, yo, I, I don't they don't understand that that has nothing to do with me or anything that I think. And so I have to fight through all of that just to begin to go through the housekeeping questions that's right but normie society says look here it is on a google search but professor of what i say the world is says that it's this way here it is on a google search well you know having to claw your way through that is back to when i was saying earlier the certain people that are going to demand answers off you and you just think look even if i gave you them all all you do is go back to where you were trying to scramble to get back to you're never going to reach any sort of elevated position from this. You're never going to go, wow, that means I might actually be able to change the world. I might be able to actually discover how something actually works. I might be able to do a whole number of things that we were formerly told that we knew and we don't. Well, that contemplation 
if that hasn't been the route that that person immediately and instinctively takes, then as far as I'm concerned, that person's a dead loss. They want to follow a guru who's got a model and has got it sussed so that they don't have to do it. Well, the they don't have to do it bit is the relinquishment of all that's good about finding this finding out about this subject, as far as I am concerned. Yep. I've literally been told that. When I've told somebody, why don't you can look into this stuff yourself? And I was told, well, I don't have to look into this stuff because thousands of scientists from all across time have done this already. I'm just like, wow. So you're just going to sit here and let somebody else that you don't know, have never met, some guy could just be wearing a white lab coat for kicks, dictate what your reality is, and you just give up your authority like that. Okay. Yes. Yes. <laughs> and when people are out there either banging their Bibles or banging on their rhetoric of you are a slave you just don't realize it many people will turn around and go actually i like being a slave and if you are to free me from this slavedom i want to find the next set of shackles as quickly as possible right if what? you're going to free me from this slavery, does that mean that you're going to be my new master? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And that's how I treat them in the chat. Oh, you want me to be your new master? Oh, you're asking me what it is. So I'm the arbiter of your new reality, am I? Oh, how privileged. Now, obviously, the reality is that they just want to hear my explanation so they can pull it apart in false dichotomy. And at the end, when they feasibly in their own mind pull apart whatever i say regardless of what it is or whether it's right or wrong will then say but therefore a sphere and therefore they can sleep a little bit easier that night yeah i mean uh, what happened last night uh, i had a okay go ahead brian sorry i haven't heard you in a minute yeah i only be a second you know sorry uh, it's that new mic it's still fantastic you can't stop talking into it. <laughs> it's a uh, no the they they, they um uh i'm not uh, go ahead either i'm not forgetting it <laughs> it's gone sorry i was just gonna say i was having a conversation with a kid yesterday who was slow at accepting what we were saying because i guess he came in thinking well obviously i know what i know you're not going to tell hold on now there's a truck oh well at least you muted up for it yeah <laughs> so um what happened was he was trying to say well um there's an equation for for telling me how how fast something's gonna drop um, therefore gravity is real. And I said, yeah, so what does that mean? And he wouldn't respond because he, he knew I, somewhere deep down, they know where we're driving at. Yeah. What, what, what does knowing how fast something drops have to do with the theory, the so-called colloquially used of gravity. And, um, he couldn't get beyond uh, that. Sorry, he and then he said, anyway. so he went on to say, well, you know, um people over the course of time like they've all they, they're, they're all going with what i know so why why would i just go with what you said i said actually did you know that that's not true they, they, they actually side with me but they stay when it comes to evidence but when it comes to what they religiously believe they say yeah i believe the opposite even though there is no evidence he said i don't believe you i read him about six quotes and then I said, and then he said, well, what about the ISS? And I said, oh, snap. Do you know somebody by the name of Paul Larson who runs the largest, I don't know about the world, but the largest planetarium in the U.S.? Did you know that he said that you can't see curvature from the ISS? And he said, that's a lie. And I said, no, I have the video right here. And you know, right before I could play it, he just left. He just, it's because you just don't left. understand. <laughs> he just okay. did <laughs> but I'm going to, because it's the theme of the show, the live show today, we only have one horizon, and the horizon in the begging the question proof of nothing perspective hijacking earth curve calculator and claim to be the horizon earth curve described from the ISS window has been debunked by the black swan. It's beyond the limits of a physical geometric sphere edge. 
So we're back to somebody on the ISS says, oh, you can't get high enough to see the horizon bend because it's Earth curve. Like, well, the horizon isn't Earth curve. So I don't care how high they claim to be on the ISS in a fake medium known as outer space, sky vacuum, second law of thermodynamics violation, doesn't alter the fact that the horizon at any altitude is an Earth curve. Correct. Can they still think of it as Earth curve, no? They Just do that. over at Gem Pandas, according to Neil earlier. Yeah. They, 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 yeah. That's they're, correct as they're well. Too far so, so why it's going to be? That's so the horizon not so being So why Earth would somebody curve? like... Oh, yeah. oh, hold on, hold on. Uh, hold on. Uh, uh, Arwin first. Uh, Go ahead, Arwin. Right, so over there it's like, yeah, horizon not being Earth curve. Well, just forget about it. Let's just ignore that. Let's just continue to imagine we're looking over the edge of a sphere. Then was it Neil or Eli and then chocolate? I was just saying you're correct on that too. Jim Pandas, they still believe that the horizon is Earth curve. So they're not, definitely not keeping up with the flat Earth debate. They close their eyes to the black swan and hold their ears like uh, one of Chocolate's co-workers and say, I'm not listening, I'm not listening, I'm not listening. So it's laughable. So where do you get to the point where one of these guys says, comes here and says, the, the horizon is Earth curve? Who says that? I've never heard anybody say that. Nobody claims that. What do you mean? Tim Osman. As that, per as that same person is literally posting pictures labeled Earth Curvature, and it's got four horizons. Like, where is the cognitive break there, man? It's like, that's, that's like, call 911, call the ambulance for them at that point. Isn't <laughs> What's that, wrong with you? Isn't that chocolate just like Hillbilly Blue Balls bringing in a pipe? And a container <laughs> and saying it's not? It's not a container. Oh, I need a citation that uh, an open pipe is a container. What? Bro, how are you guys functioning in the real world? I don't even understand with, with logic like that. It's insane. They're being told what to do. That's how. Yeah, Eli, you nailed it. <laughs> yeah, that's. No, no, Eli just nailed it because when that guy walked away, when Eli had answers to everything, he walked away because he, the cog disc was so strong, he had to walk away. Yeah, I mean, to, Nathan, to Nathan's to point, you. that's that's the more technical response, right? It, Nathan is right about that. But seeing as that I tried to point out to him that his calculations, uh, that that he wasn't making a claim yet, and he refused to make it because he because he probably seeing as that we were willing to go over the math and push him to that point he he probably felt well obviously these guys want me to reach the conclusion that I want to reach because they have some answer they're already talking about einstein versus newton and all of this and it's i'm way beyond my depth so i i didn't want to go there. as a matter of fact we did try to explain the black swan to him so that's why I said, you know what? Let's just go with the priest. Did you know this? Did you know that? Oh, did you know they said this? And then that's what killed him. Yeah, but you know what? They still need a radius for all of that. Things moving at a certain speed. That, uh, that, that all needs a radius, I think. I, yeah, I, I see. I think what, what, what Eli's trying to say is there are certain commonly held misconceptions that are contradicted even within the paradigm so even within the paradigm the earth curve is represented by the horizon that you see at certain altitudes or from the ground blocking things in the distance when it's pointed out that the claim actually is that you can't see it even within your paradigm they, they say you can't see it from the iss even that person's going to have a cognitive break from within inside their own paradigm because they're under the apprehension that obviously because they're told so the horizon's earth curve and if it's earth curve it's going to bend as you get higher up obviously it's something physical and sphere shaped therefore going to be bendy when you get above it and when you're told that that's not the case and no even the people that you would expect to be telling you you've got an affirmation of your curved shape horizon that's earth curve when you get high up they're actually saying the complete opposite so I think that's where Eli's trying to make his point in this regard. Am I right? Yes, thank you, Nathan. For me, it's edifying either way. 
<laughs> I, I want to see the break. I may be, I may be a psycho, but <laughs> I want to see it. I want to see it go. <laughs> Wait. So you're saying there's errors even within the model if you presuppose everything and all that? Who could have foreseen? Yeah, that's a very easy way to do that. Just ask a glober, how does gravity hold gas to the ball? And watch them squirm one route after another, one mechanical train of thought after another. They can't do it. It doesn't matter how they conceive it. As soon as you make it more real, as soon as you actually ho hold them to the consequences of their conceptual train of thought, it always breaks every <clears throat> single time. And did you know that, uh, uh, Nathan, um, the uh, begging the question fallacy is now yours, according to Jim Panda. Uh, every time I pointed out that they were starting their arguments out with uh, begging the question fallacy, I said, well, can't we just have a regular talk? And I'm like, so you want me to accept your fallacious argument? And he just kept on going, well, can't we just have a normal talk? But you could Nathan. do it, though. You could do it because even if you give them one of those things, there will always be more for you even within their presuppositions to point out how it doesn't work. There's always more fallacies within the globe model. Anthony would be proud. Yeah, so what Alwyn's saying is, eh, just when they say have a normal conversation, that loosely translates to, look, just, just for once, let me start this conversation with the assumption that we're on a sphere. Just let me assume it to begin with. Okay, can we just have a normal conversation where we all just think we're on a sphere to begin with before we start making any examples? Because if I can't have a normal conversation where I automatically assume a sphere, that would be begging the question of the example I'm trying to make as proof, then it really doesn't work out for me ever. So let's just be normal, assume we're on a sphere, and we'll start making examples of how I prove I'm on a sphere when I already know I am on one, because I've assumed it in the first instance. So let's all be normal and assume a sphere in the first instance. We all with me on this? What's that? Begging the question. That's just Nathan Oakley speak. Do you mind well, we got, if I read that quote again from, a little uh, bit? Do you mind if I read that quote from yesterday about begging the question that, that wasn't you? Go ahead. How, how can there be one that wasn't him when it's his? That's just crazy. <laughs> uh, maybe we'll have a cognitive break. I don't know. Listen close, guys. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, oh, crap. You know, sorry for ruining the show. Okay. Uh, here it is. Begging the question regarding the Michelson-Morley experiment by John Martin on CosmoQuest.org. How to commit the fallacy of begging the question. When a conclusion to be demonstrated is assumed into a premise, an experiment is set up to demonstrate the motion of the Earth through space. Number two, a positive result is expected from theory. Number well, well, and it's actually just a hypothesis. Number three, the experiment produces a null result. Number four, the null result has a cause. Number five, the cause of the null result is not a stationary Earth because the Earth is moving. Number six, the cause of the null result is a moving Earth. Number seven, therefore, an experiment on the moving Earth has demonstrated that C is constant in any inertial reference frame. Eight, therefore, C is constant in all reference frames. Line eight implies a moving Earth is part of the conclusion, yet line five merely asserts the Earth is moving to conclude to line eight. Therefore, the constancy of C is invalid according to the fallacy of begging the question. The only way science can conclude to one of special relativity's postulates is to beg the question on the motion of the Earth as shown above. The constancy of C in any inertial reference frame is known from a logical fallacy. Nathan Oakley. Oh, wow. my bad. I mean, John Martin. Wow, what a clusterfuck. Wait, so maybe Nathan should sue John, what was his name? John, whatever. Because uh, Nathan, uh, Nathan came up with begging the question. John, John Martin <laughs> doesn't come up with begging the question either. He's just citing it as a begging the question fallacy. You go back to the, there was one statement that you made. You said the cause of the null result. Yeah, Can I picked you go up back on that there too. Read that again? Yeah. You can't have a cause of the null. The cause of a null? The zero difference result is the null. Well, zero difference. How can you have a cause of zero difference? What caused nothing to happen? <laughs>
Was that everybody that picked that up? Because I heard that and, oh, and my brain's like, what? <laughs> what caused nothing to happen is doing the thing. <laughs> Go ahead, read it out loud one more time, man. Maybe I misheard you. Not the whole thing, just that one. A bit about the no, well, and you, you didn't mishear that. You, you, you didn't mishear it. Said that. <laughs> you read it. You read it yesterday, and I heard it yesterday. But I, I thought, did I hear that right? Like you've just done <laughs> today. I listened it really closely when he said it, and I'm like, you've got to be able to test for a cause in the zero difference result. That's what it was. Paraphrasing what it was saying. Yeah. Right, well, what is he going to read that loud again or what? Is the thing, and that's what's a no. Oh, I'm sitting here cursing Arwen out. <laughs> I wasn't even on a... Wait I wasn't even on a... Hold on, Arwen. Go ahead, Eli. So, um, the cause of the no result is not a stationary Earth because the Earth is moving. Now, the reason that I brought this up... Uh, also, I brought this up to the boy last night because I identified this very same thing um, like by the nature of how I proposed what I was proposing yesterday. So the guy is saying, well, the math proves that, <laughs> you know, I said, so is, is, is G a constant in your, in your formula? And he's like, yeah. I said, okay, so when I drop a, a ball or a rock or anything from air into a second medium, what happens? Well, well, the speed changes, but the gravity is the same. And I'm like, oh, so what you're doing is exactly what this is outlining. Basically, because even when though back the, the result is supposed no to be... Result, man. Yeah, you didn't read the right bit, Eli. So the bit is about a paragraph before, but before he describes what he's calling the cause of the zero difference result when begging the question of a sphere that spins, it's about a paragraph before oh, that when okay. he describes what he says will have a causal attribution in a zero difference result, a.k.a. null. It's about a paragraph before. Okay, so it says... The no result has a cause. Number five is the cause of the no result is not a stationary Earth God, because stop. the Earth is moving. Stop. The cause of the no result. That's it. Yeah. That's it. Whoever that is is <laughs> yeah. out of their mind. Just, it's the first no thing you said. No, no, no. Just, no. Just, he, uh, he, guys, he guys, guys. The question. Guys, yeah, just one sec. Just one sec. Just say it one more time. It was the first thing you read out just a second ago. First the statement. no result has a cause. The no result has a cause. That's nonsensical. <laughs> That's funny. So, so, so he's actually detailing how they beg the question. Yeah. it's not him saying it. Even he's worse. saying this is what it is. No, I appreciate I that. Even What's worse, he's detailing what the null result isn't. That's <laughs> correct. Yeah, no, it, it is. It's cool. It's very cool. But it's just it's. The reason it's being pointed out by quantum eraser is because in actuality, when you're not detailing a stupid begging the question fallacy of a sphere Earth that spins, if you're actually doing science, that this is why it's nonsensical. You, you can't, number one, you don't test the null, right? You're not testing for no difference. You're testing for the different. You're testing to get the effect. So, you know, to say that you test the null is it's just nonsense. It doesn't make any sense because it's like saying... I'm testing to get no result. It's like, no, 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 you, you're not. You're not testing the null. You, you test to see if what you think causes the effect causes the effect. And if it doesn't cause the effect, you validate the null. Your null being, I vary my assumed cause and it doesn't cause the effect. That's your null hypothesis. But you never test the null. Ugh. Anyway. So to say the null as a cause is just, it's just completely nonsensical and could only be put into words when describing a begging the question sphere earth fallacy of spinning. So the, so the Michelson Morley, uh, I don't know if it's, I don't know, I got to look into it. Uh, don't say experiment. It, I, I, yeah. So if, if they're attempting to use this to say it's moving, and their hypothesis is incorrect. He's saying that Globers or other people take it to mean, well, I can go forth and say, well, the null has a cause, and this is where they beg the question. No, Even no. though... Not exactly. Worse than that. He, he accurately describes what they do. So they first 
start with the experiment. That's how he details it, and he's right. That's exactly what they do. It's great. So they start with the experiment. Then he talks about, I think you corrected him by saying he means hypothesis because he said theory. No, <laughs> they take the word theory as an explanation for an experiment that hasn't started at step one with a phenomena. So he's detailing it correctly in terms of how this is constructed. Now, the reason I know he's detailing it correctly without having to pull apart him and go, whoa, stop, you don't start with the experiment, is because he's detailing the fallacy that they employ. Now, his concise description is identical to the process that QE takes them through, or did you know, back in the day when we had the pink writing. You, know, you take them through their own nonsensical buffoonery in terms of how they describe this experiment. Well, we start with the experiment. Oh, do you? No, you're supposed to start with a natural phenomena, i.e. an effect that you're trying to figure out the cause of. What is the effect? Well, the effect is the experiment. So they're starting with step three. Not formulation of hypothesis, not observe a phenomena and try and figure out what's causing it by way of formulating that hypothesis and then doing the experiment. No, no, no. Start with an experiment. And what's the experiment going to prove? Well, my begging the question fallacy that I'm assuming here. So it's really accurately described and laid out to the point where if you had a, a tertiary knowledge of how they've done this process, it would enrage you because you'd be like, stop, stop, that's not science. It's like, no, no, it isn't. But he's detailing how the process of begging a question of a sphere Earth that spins is actually put down on paper and then pulled apart again as a begging the question fallacy. It's very elegant. I love it. Well, what Jim Panda and his clan told me the other day was that the only thing that science can prove is the null. <laughs> <laughs> wow, man. These people are retarded. I mean, at a base level, yeah. we've just literally spent 10 minutes explaining how you don't test the null and that you're not trying to find a cause in the null. It's the zero difference result. And they're saying the only thing you can prove is zero difference. My God, these They're, people are stupid. It but, proves uh, what is I, not. I, I am asking if Nathan. I am asking if they were sure they were Everyone calm down. The guy who yeah. brought it up is the only one I want to hear. Uh, the guy from Discord. Well, I was just saying, uh, after they said that, I asked, I said, are you sure you want to say that? And they said, well, of course. They're getting confused with falsification of the hypothesis. Someone yeah, yeah they're saying science can only disprove things. The, the guy said that. <laughs> no, that, that's, a, that's, a, that's an admission that's going on there. Because they used to say, state, it uh, used to be stated by science that science only disproves things. And then it progressed, if you could call it progress, uh, to science doesn't prove anything. Right? And that's now that, been now that's non sequitur. I, well, that, that, I'm talking about Jim Panda and all, and that's what they've been banging on about. All these ballers for the past couple of years, science doesn't prove anything. Whereas I used to hear originally, it only disproves. Science only disproves it. Uh, yeah, that's what I used to hear originally. Well, right? now, yeah, but I, hold I, on, hold on. Finish. When you I, disprove yeah, something, yeah, you yeah, still yeah, back to prove it. I know. I know. <laughs> you, I, 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 should, leave me finish. Let me finish. They used to state that science only disproves things. And then they, as I said, if you call it progress, they progress that science doesn't prove anything, right? And now they're going back to science only disproves things because they found out that they were wrong, that it doesn't prove anything. That's my point. Now, I know when you prove something is not the cause of something, you uh, have proven something. I get that. So I'm just stating what they're doing. Can I just yeah, say something? They're retarded. One second. Uh, I'd like to go back to some old business I just heard. What has Bubby gotten himself into now? Oh, having to get the height from a flat plane. <laughs> Is that priceless? Adam props again. <laughs> Elevation angle of the mountain? Yes. Uh, didn't they? If you read that, it said he measured. The elevation angle. Oh, conspiracy cats. Rufy, do you know what measurement is of elevation angles? Not calculate. Elevation angles. How do you get those? How do you get the angular size of something? Do you calculate it? Or do you measure the angular size? 
clowns. Thanks. Okay, you you turn appealing to retards. S yeah. Street guy, go ahead. Well, I, I was uh, just a correction to what was stated. It's pseudoscience doesn't prove things, not science. Science does prove things. Yeah, their version of what they call science is actually pseudoscience, just so stories. They need a little bit of we weasel room left at the end of it were it to be proven incorrect as a just so story. So when they assert it as science, they need to pepper that with a little bit of weaseliness and say, well, ultimately, science doesn't really prove anything. You know, it just leaves it a little bit more told as a story, I guess. You know, that's what they've got to pepper it with. You go forth to say, well, what about all these scientific discoveries that absolutely advance mankind, with cause and effect relationships being established through systematic experimentation based on a viable hypothesis, based on a phenomena that people were trying to figure out the cause of? Isn't that proving things? Because my understanding was that it had to prove something at the end of the process. Either you null or your alternative will be proven at the end of that process. Well, the will be proven bit kind of flies in the face of your my just so story I call science could be disproven at any time. Therefore, I'll say science as a whole doesn't prove anything. Yeah, it does. It's just you didn't have any ever. Yeah, it's yeah. devastating to somebody like Weak Sauce. I mean, Vsauce was yeah, a whole Trump channel like full of crap that's claimed to be science and then wants to go in and have an interview and say, oh, it's supposed to be a 3D spheroid, but I don't know that. Science doesn't prove things. Yeah, but way before Flat Earth, yeah. I remember my son saying that to me. He was about 13 years old and he, was, he used to say that to me. You know, science doesn't prove yeah. things. And they've needed to redefine science that way so that they can call the pseudoscience that they do science. Yeah, they need to pass off their just-so stories. And it's been manufactured or engineered that way in terms of our education structure. So it's been educate we've been educated in an, uh, a method that's empirical. And we're told in no uncertain terms that it's going to prove things. And we were told at a, that tentative age where you're just about paying it enough attention for it to sink in, but not enough to re realise the wider-reaching implications when the same exact book that's telling you tells you under the guise of science, about a just-so story with planets and orbits. Now, you're not necessarily of age to distinguish those two things, but you recognise what you're told in no uncertain terms with the empiricism. From that point forward, you will then essentially recognise the word science to mean proof of things. So wherever it is employed, obviously, like I say, with the peppering of weasel words that allows them to maintain and adjust their stories at any given moment, you're going to be recognizing that they say science and therefore that means proof and when uh, chocolate's friend that came on the show the other day or work colleague that came on the other day was like well there's plenty of people out there that have already figured this out the white coats have already done this for me it's like yeah but those white coats we're telling you how they've not actually employed science that in itself is a deception but people just don't want to accept that you know, they want the white coats to be true they tell us and then they tell us that, that that's a childish version of science that we teach the kids and that we, when they get older and go into universities, then they're told, you know, the more detailed nuances of science. Is, that, that's not so much true, the simple empiricism that they were taught when they were younger. No, they're taught maths. Shut up and calculate is what they're actually given to do. So they're never actually given any adherences to the scientific method in these fields that we discuss on this show. They're told to calculate things. And they're told, and you'll find it defined very easily, how empirical maths is. How that maths is reality. I can totally understand and appreciate why someone like Red Rhetoric, as though we poke fun at him for saying maths is reality, you can find easy citation for that. Because that's what you need if you're the person that's running the world with pseudoscience and mathematics. You need maths to be reality. Because that's what they're punting as reality. So therefore, the two become intertwined. Empiricism and scientific method, and maths and abstract worldviews and philosophies. They all get thrown in the same pot. And at the end of it, you just hear one thing. Science? Oh, well, that's proof then, isn't it? The scientists say, well, then it's proof. Now, if you sh say to them, 
well, what you're giving me back after telling me this scientist has told you is a load of statistics. Why, why would you ever believe that that's true? They go, because a scientist gave it me. <laughs> so those people are easily kept on that, you know, plateau of believing they're on a sphere because the current rhetoric says so. And that's all that's required for the most part for most of the world. And that is a sad truth that you, at some point, have to accept and either stand back and laugh at the majority of society or lose yourself in a rabbit hole of frustration wanting to free a world that doesn't want to be freed. Yeah. I wanted to don't, just don't add something to what John was saying. Be... In that, in, in that you, you do discredit or disprove the previously accepted hypothesis. Yo, I'm getting an echo. We got somebody echoing, man. Um, so you, you would refute the previous hypothesis, but then, like John said, you would be proving something else in its place. So they often refer to gravity that when it was superseded, that's a perfect example of science proving science wrong by challenging a hypothesis and then coming up with a new improved version that is standing there to be tested until falsified and a new one is placed above it or supersedes it. Well, yeah, of course, so the design design hypothesis like, for the first story in the first place. Yeah, it's like we disproved the thing we said we proved. <laughs> wow. <laughs> and when did you prove the first thing? Oh, never. Well, they mistook a hypothesis for an explanation in the first instance. So where it was described and read out in that explanation as being a theory, well, theory would be the end result. But they insert it at the beginning because they're actually taking what would be a hypothesis if done correctly as an explanation. And that explanation, just so story, which they might even claim has come as a result of an experiment, as opposed to a supposition that's yet to be validated. It's the explanation after the experiment without a phenomena to study. Well, all of these steps lead you to the exact same place. Pseudoscience, not science. Just so stories that can be adjusted at any time because they weren't based on empiricism to begin with. So we've got colleges and universities offering an enormous departments of sciences covering all aspects, including natural science. And at the end, Jim Panda says it doesn't prove anything. So all this money going from the parents for the students to go to a source that doesn't prove anything. Yeah, that's what makes the world go around, it would seem. QE, at the beginning of this, before you got here, the question was raised, why isn't there people in high-up academia that are working in natural sciences that ask the question, how is it possible that the sun was being discussed at the time uh, is, is operating as a second law of thermodynamics violation? Now, there was a couple of examples given where people have questioned the sun, but they're only questioning certain aspects of it that wasn't in incongruent with the current rhetoric anyway so that was the question what why aren't people in academia looking at this and i gave you specifically as an example i was like you're not going to like this i was like despite the fact that qe's origin story comes with his own um self-confessed embarrassment as, as to why he hadn't asked that question of himself up until that point it still remains the case that there's not lots of people out there asking these questions so i wondered if you could give us your take on what you feel mystic meg style would be the reason why people haven't asked this question high up in academia to date why haven't the people been questioned by it or why haven't the people questioned themselves which what, question are we asking? why haven't the people up in academia for example said how is it possible we're breathing if the sky is a vacuum or how is it possible that the plasma gas isn't expanding into a vacuum the plasma gas it's the sun Yeah, because they it just goes right by. You don't think about it. Simple. Should I try an answer on that? Unless, not, told to well, make on, unless somebody challenges you, like they did with me, right? Is it when because that that's, that's, that's already Yeah, I wonder his answer. His answer was, unless somebody challenges you, as they did with me, then you're not going to contemplate it or consider it. Is that correct, Kiwi? Yeah, so I've never, I never really thought about it. And, and I was going okay, to ask you. Can I give an alternative? You can, but I just want Eli to say, because it was his question. Yeah. Um, so, 
I guess my question, so academia, like in the professors, no one ever proposes the question the way that guy did to you? Ever? Like it just doesn't come up? I, I don't know. I'm not in all those places. <laughs> don't need to. It's self-evident. Don't need to. If it has, they're not verbalizing it publicly, so therefore it's self-evident. Don't they assume that they already know the answer to that? Oh, done. Everyone else. The guy who's tried to get in three or four times. Was it Screet? Sorry, thank you. Screet. Uh, could it be that they realize they realize it, but they want to keep their jobs, so they're not going to speak out for the truth because they they invested their lives into this, and if they speak out, they'll end up losing their jobs. Yeah, that's a big. That's a hand way. I don't like those ambiguous they's right that's you could possibly be correct but you're just speculating right yes that I very well may be the case for the, just... hold on hold on for, the, for those that don't publicly say it that we couldn't possibly know this of then maybe they say i'd rather keep my job and keep my mouth shut that is definitely a possibility but by the same token it's still just self-evident that they're not going public with this information Therefore, in terms of the only source I've got now to date to tell me why it wasn't contemplated, it just wasn't, is the answer. And why would it be? You know, if there's some sort of fraud going on with the roads that are being laid outside your building, you just see the building of the road and don't give it any thought. Now, when somebody comes up to you and goes, did you realise that they used criminals to lay that road? You go, no, I didn't realise. I don't know what I don't know and hadn't ever even contemplated it. Well, you know there's fraud and that people build the roads, don't you? Aren't you involved in driving on roads? Yeah, I am. Yeah, yeah, heavily involved. Well, shouldn't you be? No, of course not. You don't know what you should be contemplating if you're not contemplating it. That's Jim Panda, <laughs> Shamalama Gamma Panda, Ding Dong's favorite argument. He's admitted to it. Uh, it's on one of the numpty clips, can't remember which one, that their favorite argument, him and M. Scott Beach, the PhD booger eating schmuck, that if if that was the case, that, that the vacuum of space was second law of thermodynamics violation, then how many tens of millions of people, which, which there ain't tens of millions, but you get my drift, how many you know people know about the second law of thermodynamics and haven't said anything? Guess what that is? <laughs> Sorry, isn't that appeal to silence or something fallacy? What's the one? Yep, argument to silence fallacy. That's the one, argument yep. to silence fallacy. Because nobody's mentioned it, so what? If you're in, a fu in an elevator and suddenly something wretched happens and then everyone gets off and nobody says a word, well, therefore nobody farted. <laughs> <laughs> Basically. Oh, someone would have mentioned it. It was wretched. It just didn't happen. In the, in the movie The Matrix, uh, we would call that a glitch, right? When someone questioned what was going on. Hey, how about if a tree falls in the woods and nobody there is willing to admit it, does it still fall? No, and there is no tree. But there is a branch of science. <laughs> hey chocolate do you like that i love doing that <laughs> yeah. don't have to give the no it's better if you just say there is no tree as the response just prove the null that was a good one Ted. That just prove right. the null just prove your zero difference result i do that all day i win without even trying They prove nothing. Yeah. Zero difference. Didn't even have to try. You need the cause of that now. <laughs> Sorry, you need the cause of that zero difference? You're right. That's imperative that I get that cause of that zero difference result. Yeah, why did nothing happen? That's what's being asserted with Coriolis. Let's just round out why, because we're getting into the farcical and laughing about it without summarising why it's being said. Well, their zero difference is Earth turning underneath without you being able to notice anything happening, so they assume Earth's turning underneath, begging the question fallacy. Right? 
Zero difference. We must be able to test that we won't see any effect of Earth turning underneath. It's complete nonsense. But that's what you have to do if you're going to formulate a claim that has an effect that isn't observed. That's what you have to descend into. Just logical farces. Complete logical fast. So, so we know Earth's turning underneath because we've never measured Earth turning underneath. Yeah, basically. Well, that's, well, I think it was George one time who said he was on here years ago, and he said, "Yeah, the proof of Earth not spinning is that we can't tell it's spinning. <laughs> we don't notice cool. it. We don't see it, and that's the proof that it's not." Oh, okay. that hurt, that yeah, hurt and, my and, brain. No, so yeah, it's yeah, not and. Spinning. and and you you go back to like uh, you know History Channel and all these all this more moronic shit, right? And they tell you, yeah, if the Earth stops spinning, that's when we'd notice, because everything would just shift off the Earth and we'd be flying all over the place. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. The Stop. term you're looking for is non-inertial. So when we describe the two different reference frames that are described in Coriolis effect, right? If you Forget about Earth for a minute and just think about it in terms of a roundabout. The idea that you're seeing this Coriolis force, and I'm going to use that word intentionally in this example, the reason you're seeing or being subjected to a force is because the frame of reference you are on, from your vantage point, i.e. from what you're perceiving and seeing, isn't moving. It's non-inertial. Does that make sense? It's the spinning reference frame, but it's described as non-inertial. Well, why would that be? Well, because the effect you're going to see that's going to be induced, that's going to be described as a force, yeah, is induced because you're seeing an effect happen while the platform you stand on isn't doing anything. You're standing on something and you're not moving around on it. It's all one frame of reference. The fact that it's moving is something that you're not going to be taking into consideration when you describe the effect. So you're watching an, an effect... That isn't really happening. But you're going to be describing it as though it is. You're going to be describing the curved path. Well, the only reason you can do that is because from your frame of reference, you are describing it as though you're not moving. You're on a non-inertial frame of reference, describing the movement of something in an inertial frame of reference. Now, when you get down to the nitty-gritty of why that happens, well, it's obvious because you're turning underneath it. But you're not recognising that turn as the motion. You're recognising the curve in the path of the object in the inertial frame. That's why it's perfectly acceptable to describe it as a force. Yeah? Because it's an apparent force. You do actually see the thing curving. Yeah? Well, that's only induced because you're turning underneath. But it doesn't change the fact that you are seeing that force apparent in your vision on a non-inertial so, reference frame. So technically, wouldn't that be a uh, what's the, the identity fallacy? Um, what, what's the identity fallacy? Um, uh, sorry, I'll shut up. I don't think I, I maybe know what you're driving at. You're saying if, you, if you're going to identify something because that is stationary and then re-identify it as non-inertial, then that's yes. a, 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 a fallacy of identity. What, what's the name of that fallacy? I'm sorry? Well, you're calling it an identity no, fallacy, just, but that's close enough for me. It's just the law of identity violation. There you Is go. Is that where you're going for? Yeah, yeah. Wouldn't that technically be one of those? Because you're describing something that's not real. It, it I isn't, think isn't, maybe... It, it is at the point that you point out that the effect isn't observed anymore. So for it to be accurately identified without a violation of the law of identity, then to be non-inertial, you have to have the effect induced. In other words, you must see things that follow a straight path seem to curve, i.e. you must see drift to describe it as a non-inertial reference frame. Now to just say, well, in that description, I don't notice any effect of the frame itself. I'm standing on it and part of it, right? Therefore, no effect to observe in terms of me feeling any spin from the frame of reference. It's just the effects I see outside of that frame of reference in the inertial frame. But that would mean that on a turning Earth, that I'm assuming, I'm not going to feel any effects. It's just a bastardization of the description in Coriolis because it's got a useful 
uh, juxtaposed force, apparent force, you will see it, with a non-inertial reference frame that they need to be not exhibiting any effects. And they can mix that up and match that up depending on who's arguing with them and their understanding of the subject to either assert you're not going to notice any effects, like Blue Marble saying, it's non-inertial. What's to notice? It's not turning underneath anything. Gives you the law of identity violation because if it's non-inertial, you would see Earth turning underneath the hot air balloon. That's how it gets the identity as non-inertial. The drift you see in the balloon as you turn underneath it would be the Coriolis force observed, making the frame of reference non-inertial. We don't see it, therefore it's just stationary. Not non-inertial, just not moving. The Morosopher bio-duel... Hold on a second. The Morosopher bio-duel has sort of put it out there that he used to work on F-15s, you know, inside the, the uh, instrument panels and stuff, you know, the technical stuff like that. He said that there is a Coriolis force gauge in the F-15s. Oh, it's just a fundamental yep. misunderstanding of how Coriolis works. Oh, is, is that person actually saying <laughs> no, yes? Hold on. Was, was this person actually here? No, he, he, won't, he will never come here. He's, okay. a, he's a numpty dipshit. Okay, okay. Just for anybody who ever comes across this argument, you can't have a Coriolis detector that operates in an inertial reference frame. That means that the effect is only capable of being observed if you're turning underneath something. So it's the effect you observe as you turn underneath something. So if I'm describing Coriolis effect, I'm looking at an aeroplane and describing how it looks like it's curving when it isn't because I'm on a roundabout. Oh, look, there goes the plane. Oh, it's gone. Oh, there it is again. Oh, it's gone. Oh, it curves away from it. Oh, it's gone. Yeah, that curve that it takes as you spin on the roundabout is Coriolis deflection. The plane's not actually doing anything. It's just flying in a straight line. But from your vantage point on a roundabout, it looks like it curves. Right? That's Coriolis deflection. Now, for the plane to have a Coriolis detector, notice how I used a roundabout for my example, yeah? Well, that would mean that on the plane, the moment you start spinning on the roundabout and looking at the aeroplane, the pilot gets a call from radio, from ground control going, you have a man watching you from a roundabout. Adjust your path, because from his point of view, you're looking like you're curving. It's absolutely preposterous. You're off course. <laughs> you, you look like you're off course from the guy's perspective on the roundabout. Quick, adjust <laughs> your straight path that looks like it's curving for the guy on the roundabout. It's preposterous to say that a projectile would have a Coriolis detector. It's absurd. <laughs> yeah, it's going to need a moving runway detector, though. <laughs> D damn yeah, right. going to actually happen. Damn right. Chocolate saying you'd need a moving runway detector because if your observing plane seemed to curve because you're turning beneath them on a spinning earth, then you, and let's say you're watching it curve from a runway, you're turning underneath it seemed to curve on that runway then, aren't you? Look at that plane seem to curve as I stand in the middle of this runway. That's going to cause a problem for him as it comes into land. Because I'm turning beneath him, aren't I? To see him seem to drift. Obviously, he's travelling towards us in a straight line. But we're turning beneath him. So when he gets to landing on this runway, there's going to be a point where he stops travelling in the inertial reference frame and suddenly makes contact with a frame of reference that's turning beneath him. That's going to be a big problem. Of course, he doesn't have to worry about any of that because it's not turning beneath him and we don't see planes seem to take a curved path because we're turning beneath them. Nor do we observe drift in anything that leaves Earth's surface because we're not turning beneath anything ever. Oh, you big dummy. That's because the Earth isn't rotating underneath the hot air balloon. What do you think? That, I think that debunks the claim that Globe makes in the case of Blue Marble Science that there is 15 degrees an hour drift and we will see hot air balloons drift away from us at 15 degrees an hour because we're turning underneath them. His answer to that is we don't turn underneath them. Welcome to Flat Earth Blue Marble. Instead of thanks, Bob, it should be thanks, Blue. <laughs> Idiot. I thought um, I was a Coriolis detector if the Earth was spinning. 
You are. Yeah, As the you, observer, you would be that's one correct. All day. That's correct, 10th. You are the Coriolis detector if you're on something that's rotating. That's right. We got an inner ear. Uh, I think I would have been the Coriolis detector as I worked at an no. airport for almost no. a decade. Oh, we just ruined everything. No, the inner ear, inner ear would be the thing that ruins the example in Coriolis because the frame of reference is non-inertial. Didn't I just explain this two minutes ago? You, yeah, you... you're right. I turned it inside out. But you can detect motion and that will probably help you assist detecting not motion. Correct. That's right. So if you're on a roundabout, regardless of the fact that you can mathematically describe you being non-inertial, that would be, oh, I don't notice that I'm spinning. Oh, why is this tree coming towards me? Oh, well, trees have got very aggressive these days. No, there's just a limb hanging over the roundabout and you spun towards it. But it works on the assumption that you don't realise that your frame of reference is turning. You're non-inertial, right? Uh, yeah, but unfortunately we do actually have an inner ear. And those sorts of changes would be detectable and we just don't. Nah, the whole vestibular system is just, it's just there for kicks. And they well, there say that the good. gas Excuse. is moving with the Earth. <laughs> and so anything flying or moving within that atmospheric gases are therefore moving with the Earth. Oh, I've just got to eat humble yeah. pie. Hold on. It away. Just looked it up, Arwin. Apparently, gravity solves that problem of the inner ear. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Is that Newtonian or Einsteinian gravity? It's don't drag this joke out because I haven't got anything else to go forward with it with. <laughs> it, it was Newtonian because that's a force and that's what applies. That's what you can detect with the inner air. Acceleration, nope, the based motion. Nope. 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 The, the autolithic organs in the inner vestibular apparatus are immune from gravity. It's already documented. It's just amazing to me that they no, constantly uh... ignore the fact that Newtonian gravity was debunked or uh, falsified. Yeah, that's another they topic. Ignore it. I... So some of them don't ignore that. it. Some of them just decide to argue it when they feel comfortable arguing it. Because sometimes they'll say, yeah, it's a, like Rumpus will come here and argue his ridiculous uh, uh, Einsteinian freaking bending and warping in space-time, right? Tell us that those equations work in the fourth dimension. <laughs> great. <Ooh. laughs> That's what you need. Woo. Perfect. With that, I'm going to say a huge, massive, enormous thank you to both Discord and G Plus panels for making today's after show possible. And of course, a massive thank you to all of you in either Nathan Oakley 1980 or Nathan Oakley premiering streams for hopefully smashing the super chat liking, commenting, sharing, subscribing, and all that good stuff. Also below this video, you can get £50 for swapping your UK electricity supplier to Octopus Energy. I've been Nathan Oakley, and I will see you all in the next video.